see everybody. We've got a good split here. We've got a little over half of returning students, so kind of know what craziness you're in for. And about three or four or five of you guys are brand new, and I welcome you all. Um, this is kind of the tail end of my first year of teaching on Zoom, and you can see I've mastered it. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> but it is a lot of fun. It's so neat having students from all over the place. Last uh, last time we even had a student joining us from Haiti. I hope she's okay. I heard there's been oh a lot God. of turmoil in Haiti. That uh, I think their president was assassinated yesterday. Oh um, so hopefully she's okay. Um, or stays okay. And, uh, but anyways, it's really interesting and fun for me to have students from the East Coast, from all over the place, even the outskirts of Portland that, you know, the drive-in can be pretty brutal, um, just like any big city. And uh, I like teaching from my studio, even though I don't clean it for you guys. You can see in the background there, it's pretty messy. Um, but I love having everything on hand because there's always books or paintings or materials that, you know, I, I carry a big tote to my workshops and my classes, but you can never carry everything. So it's great when people ask questions and I can just hop up and just say, ah, right here, look at this, um, and things like that. I like this to be a very interactive class. I know a lot of my fellow teachers put everybody on mute and keep them on mute, but I actually really enjoy the uh, give and take, the questions, and um, I, you know, I write a lot of notes before class and try to stay organized, but at the same time, I really like to be responsive and go down the rabbit holes with you as you ask questions, because we're all on different um, levels. We all are at different stages. Um, some of you have been taking classes with me huh, for off and on, some of you 16 years ago, some of you uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, and... Um, some of you have been, you know, taking classes off and on with me for years, and then a, a number of you are, this is your first time. So um, I will try to touch and answer as many questions as I can without being too, too repetitive. What I can often do, too, is if there's a lot of, hey, Gail, she found it. All right. Um, what we can do, too, is I'm not a, uh, opposed to staying a little bit late. So if... Um, <laughs> If a number of you have uh, absolute questions about like even just how do I set up my palette or clean my brushes or things like that, I'm not opposed to staying a little bit longer and going over that or shooting a little extra video and just posting it to our Facebook page. Um, there's things I can do like that. Or if everybody's kind of down for it today, maybe I can walk you through really quickly just kind of how I do set up my palette and kind of the setup on my easel so that, you know, if you're pretty new to painting and or setting up your studio or questions about that, um, I can show you some of that. So maybe just quickly raise your hand so I could see it. If you would like to see a quick overview just of my studio setup as we get started on the easel today. All right. So it looks like that's, I'm going to, I'm just going to do a quick 10 minute one. Sorry, Sully. Sorry, Linda. I know you guys have seen it a number of times. That'll be your chance to go get a fresh cup of coffee. Um, and uh, so I'll do that when I step up to the easel. I normally start class sitting here face to face. I like to see all you guys as shiny, happy faces in the morning and uh, check in. And uh, then if we want, I um, we'll pop over to, I can do a control or a share screen and I can go to, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to share screen and I'm going to go to our, um, Michael, can you mention about holding down the space bar when we want to talk, but otherwise staying muted and, uh, that way when we watch it back, we don't see our faces pop up. Sure, that's a great idea. And I will try to do real quick before I do the share screen. Let me put myself as the primary. Thank you for reminding me of that. So yeah, that's a great shortcut for those of you. Um, you just push push and hold down the space bar to unmute yourself if you just have a quick question. And that way um, it doesn't stay unmuted, especially if you have dogs or garbage collection out on the streets. It'll steal the uh, screen and keep it on there. So I'm doing... Spotlight for everybody. So now everybody should see me with you guys on the side. Um, Michelle 
Fritzler, would you mind talking really quick and see if the screen goes to you? One, two, three, four, one, two, three. One, two, All three. right, did the screen go to Michelle or did it stay on me there? It stayed, stayed on, on you. you. Perfect, is everybody cool with that or would you guys like all, you should be able to see yourselves kind of on the periphery. You can control your view in the upper right hand corner, but otherwise this will keep the camera on me and that way when I'm painting and demoing and things like that, it doesn't get stuck on uh, somebody else for a little while. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a share screen and we're gonna go over to our Facebook page. All right, so everybody see the Facebook page real quickly here? Yes. 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 Great. All right, so we've got 11 members. I think we have 15 or 16 students, so we're still waiting on a couple of you to come over. Um, it, it does look like I have to uh, let you in for some of you, so sorry about that. Uh, maybe after class I can figure that out. Um, otherwise, I'll just let you guys in as I see you. Um, the Facebook page is our kind of community uh, spot in between classes. So I just posted like a, the self critique um, thing here, which is uh, really actually pretty long. And I emailed it to you too. Um, I will often duplicate both on the Facebook page and through email with handouts and stuff like that, just to make sure you get it. Same thing with the links to the videos that are being recorded and to the Zoom class um, link. Um, I also just posted, it looks like uh, nine or 10 little quick uh, reference photos. I'm going to be demoing today using this one and this one. So this is actually a view from um, our family cabin. It was there on Saturday. Did not look like this. It was hot and uh, sunny. But um, And then this is a view from a wetlands just over the hill from our house, um, kind of a protected wetlands birding area. Um, and so those are two spots I know well. You are totally welcome throughout this entire class to use any references you want. I simply supply them to make it easy for you. If you would like to use them, feel free. Um, if you wanna use your own, even better. Um, You'll also see in my class that I'll often combine references. So um, I will bring in the design elements from one, the color elements from another, maybe the theme and the mood from yet a third painting. And that's where that critique sheet that I just sent you uh, really comes in handy because that's a way of checking and making sure we have a firm idea as we get started. Um, yeah, that's the only things that are really important that I posted so far on there. Um, but please feel free to comment, to ask questions, to post your work. Um, this is a smaller class than we've had in the past, just because it's a shorter class and a little less, um, a little shorter sign up period. But uh, it doesn't matter because I think with 15 people, we still have plenty and just be active on there. It'll make the class much more enjoyable for you and for everybody else. If you'd like to simply just sign in and just say hello, maybe a little bit about you. Like, I would love to know more about Tebby. Where, did, where does Tebby live? What does Tebby like to paint? Kind of things like that. What is Karen's favorite color? I don't know, whatever you wanna say and introduce about yourselves. Um, and I know that some of you've done it in classes past. You can just copy and paste it back into here so that, uh, we can all learn about each other again. Um, and that's up to you completely if you want to do that. But it's just a fun way to, uh, makes it just easier to communicate. And it means more when we're getting comments and feedback. So anyways, that is our almost empty Facebook group page. So fill it up, give it some love. Let's make a little tiny community of 15, 16 of us and have a great time and share. All right, the next thing I'm going to share, I'm gonna do stop share on this. And gonna go over to my Photoshop. Can everybody see my Photoshop page? I've got the picture up of the cabin. Yes. Great. Yes. I just use Photoshop because it's the one I'm used to. This is a super, super old Photoshop. If I update it, they'll make me pay a monthly subscription now. Um, there are lots of 
cheap or free photo manipulating software, especially like on your iPhone and iPad or, you know, smartphones. Um, it's up to you if you want to use them. This is a great way for me to, um, uh, for me to um, show really quickly. I'm trying to find my tools. They're hiding over on the other. I've got a, two monitors going. So anyways, um, it's a great way for me to just kind of draw both on my photos and my paintings and yours and, um, you know, without actually painting on your paintings. Because if I were, if we were all together in a classroom, of course, I could, uh, I could, you know, come around and demo a lot easier. But with, uh, I'm just trying to grab the tools I'm going to need there for some reason on the other screen. Um, I can uh, draw, demo, cut, edit, do all those different things and um, show you kind of my thought process uh, of how I'm thinking about editing and what I might want to do to these. Okay, so this class is the, uh, what is it called? It's the uh, of poetry of color and design, right? Or design and color. So the first couple of weeks, I really want to focus on the design side. And the second two weeks, we're really going to dive into the color side. And I hope I don't get too many eye rolls when I tell you, and you maybe already know what I'm going to say here, is we're going to do a black and white today. Um, I often start my paintings in black and white or in very, very limited, very um, monochromatic um, settings. I will show you some of my paintings that are in progress. Um, Lately, I've been starting a lot of my paintings using acrylic paint, black and white acrylic paint, which just allows me to get in there, get it covered. Um, usually I can, you know, I don't have to let it dry for more than two, three days. Um, it's, it takes longer than the half hour, which, you know, we all think acrylics dry in about a half hour and they do, but we actually need to let them cure um, properly. At least that's what's recommended by the manufacturers. So when I paint with acrylics, I usually plan to get back to them in about two to three days. I also paint on very firm substrates for the most part. I do paint on um, canvas when they get really large, but I prefer panels. And that's just a personal thing, but you'll see I can be pretty mean to my surfaces, rubbing and scrubbing and scraping and doing different things, um, even using a sander every once in a while. Um, so having a wood substrate or a wood with the canvas attached to it uh, seems to work better for me but that was a uh, transition over a number of years so you're free to work on whatever you like um, if you are just truly treating this class like i'm going to be doing a lot of sketches and i don't want to spend a lot of money on substrates uh, just investing in some acrylic gesso g-e-s-s-o is basically the white primer paint that's on the canvas um, you can gesso over almost anything, cardboard, paper, um, whatever you want and paint right on that. And that makes really inexpensive surfaces. I oftentimes will go to the framing store and ask for their uh, scrap um, mat boards, looking for the acid free ones ideally. And then I just gesso those and that just makes a really inexpensive little hard cardboard surface to paint on. Um, a couple coats of gesso and you're off to the races. Um, the gesso, just like the acrylic paint, I try to let it dry at least two days, three days, ideally, um, before painting my oil paints onto there because it's not only needs to be dry, it likes to be cured. Okay, that makes sense to everybody? Yeah. Great. So I want to talk about my two designs that I chose for myself today. Um, this uh, view from the cabin. And this is another view from the cabin. If you're new to this, or if you don't want to start off with a kind of a complicated scene, there's a lot of stuff going on in the foreground here with the grasses and the dead leaves and dead branches and all that detail. So I also went ahead and posted just a beautiful um, kind of a clean uh, minimalist photo from that same morning. Um, and I think this is really nice. I think this could make a beautiful painting. And again, always welcome to choose whatever you would like. If I was doing this one, you know, it's got this great big open foreground. 
and I could decide, you know what, maybe that's so much space I could come in and change the edit. Maybe it would look good as a horizontal, a little, a little more relaxing. So if I do this and come in and crop that, I've got a nice horizontal. So what we're gonna be talking about is the editing of our references today and trying to find what is the main concept? Um, what is the, you know, we're gonna define our main idea. And I want you guys to put that down in writing. For those of you who can get in the habit of writing down your ideas with your thumbnail sketches, and we'll talk about thumbnail sketches here in a second, or no tan sketches, whichever you prefer to do. Um, and I'll explain what that is. Um, you're going to do better. You're going to put down your main idea and you're going to be able to stick to it a little better. Because what happens invariably with painting is, is that we get distracted and sucked in by all of the details and we get sidetracked and it's, you know, it's the pretty new shiny object. So we kind of want to remember why did I sit down or stand up at the easel to start painting this in the first place? I like to use the example of when we're in the car, maybe as a passenger, hopefully not the driver, and we're going through a beautiful area and we pull up our phone and we snap a couple photos and then we kind of forget about them, look at them a month or two later. And uh, we're kind of like, why did I take that picture in the first place? What was it about this? Was it the sunset? Was it the light on that rock? Was it how the tree was silhouetted? What was it that I was interested in why did I pull this photo? Maybe it was just that there was a deer in it. Maybe it was a subject thing versus a lighting thing. But that is kind of our main concept. A lot of people make the mistake when they're thinking main concept, they think the main thing. Like if I, if I was looking at this sunrise or yeah, this is a sunrise at the lake here, I, I wouldn't write, you know, sunrise over lake, misty lake. That's not my main concept. That's just the thing. For me, the main concept would be beautiful, warm colors surrounded by cool colors with a combination of lost and found edges, right? We've got the fog kind of obliterating and softening the edges. This is such a good one because when we look at the focal area, it is so obvious, right? It's got the crispest edges. It's also got the biggest contrast between light and dark. And it's got the biggest contrast between cool and warm. Our eyes love contrast. Our brains love contrast. So when trying to decide where's the focal area or what is this painting about, it probably is going to have some sort of contrast in there that's a little more extreme than the others. I'm not saying that that would be in the photo necessarily, but we're going to look for it in our painting. So if I bring up this one as an example, again, the wetlands near my house, I'm going to look at this and I've got to decide what is this photo about? More importantly, what is it that draws me to this photo? And it can be different than when I took the photo. I could say, well, when I took the photo, it was about uh, you know, this tree over here and it's contrast with the dark area. But when I go back to the photo, what is it that excites me? Like what stopped me as I was scrolling through my thousands and thousands of photo references? What was interesting about this? What's the main concept I want to do? And for me, I think it's these interesting dark shapes of the trees against the light shape of the sky. I got this just interesting forms. And I think I can come in there and do some interesting things with it. We've also got this really nice light and dark in the grasses, right? There's almost like a patterning going as it goes back, kind of these striations. Um, so there's nice warm contrast. And I could really, if I decide that that's what it's about, the warms versus the cools, then I will know that my reference can actually be pushed. And when I come in, maybe I'm gonna wanna cool down some of these shadows even more to make the warms feel more like it. So that's another thing that happens when I figure out the main concept is I can figure out what needs to be pushed and pulled. We are never going to be slavish to our photo references, okay? 
you guys, class one, everybody gets their artistic license. No test necessary. Congratulations. Um, you guys get to change and manipulate and do anything you want. Karen, you and I were at, talking about um, at the beginning before everybody joined us about memory. So this would be where my memory would come into play. I would be using this photo, but let's say there's just some of these trees I don't quite love the shapes. Maybe like this middle one right in the middle here. I'll uh, put this around it. Maybe this guy's just a little bit too triangular. It's kind of boring for being um, encircled out here by light. So it be, kind of becomes almost a focus to itself because it's framed. So maybe this tree could be more interesting for me. So I might go back to my memory of different tree, tree shapes. And if, you know, if nothing pops out, I can go through my references and, you know, look for other trees. I can get rid of this tree so that it's not there. I can prune the tree. I can make the tree bigger. I can make the tree smaller. I can make the tree a different color. There's so many things I can do. So what, after I figured out kind of my main concept and I've got my photo, at least one of my references chosen, that's what I'm going to begin to do is I'm going to begin to go through and question it, questioning everything. So the first thing I want to do is I want to look to the format of the photo. So this is called a portrait format or a vertical, right? Meaning that it's up and down, uh, it's taller than it is wide. And typically, for whatever reason, landscapes are done horizontally, portraits are done vertically, right? And that's just kind of the tradition of it all. Doesn't mean that, that they can't be the other way around. But let's see if, what if I decided I wanted to, you know, change that I'm just going to copy and pull up another thing and paste it in there. So now I've got two versions of it. All right. So I got my vertical and I've got my horizontal. So I've tested two different edits about it. Which one of these to me or to you, feel free to speak up if you have any opinions on the matter at this point, but which one feels better? Um, you know, and it's no right or wrong. They're both fine one has a longer the vertical one has this nice long lead in makes the creek more uh, makes it more about the creek this one zooming in a little bit kind of feeling where it becomes more about these trees less about the foreground um, Love the horizontal yeah I, I mean thus far i'm kind of leaning towards that one i'm going to go back to my vertical real quick and let's let's even look at it a little closer okay what else do i really like what do i like less um I really like this bunch of three trees here. I like this reflection. These trees are kind of interesting. This over here, it's not as interesting. So I can simply say, you know what, let's make this one a little more about the sky. Let's do even less foreground. And let's just try this edit. So you, that's why I love my Photoshop versus, you know, doing a bunch of prints of this and cutting them up, which is fine. You know, if you have a printer, you can do that. Um, what is it? So there's another horizontal. So we can compare that horizontal, oops, maybe, to this horizontal. So I just kind of zoomed in. It definitely doesn't feel as balanced as this. This one's a little more imbalanced. This is much larger than this, but it doesn't feel like it's toppling over to the right. So I'm thinking about all these different aspects. Um, I still think I like my first edit a little better. Um, but you know, with this, let's go ahead and push this even more. Let's take this further. Let's go back to a horizontal. And there we go. So now it's a completely different painting, right? Than where we started off at. And a lot of times, if you have a good reference that has a lot of material in it, by zooming in, you can actually get two, three, four paintings. I've definitely had that happen where you are up on a hilltop, you know, and you shoot with your wide angle lens and you just get the whole valley. And then when you start to zoom in, you're like, oh, that farm down there, that one's really cool. And oh, look at that creek over there or river or whatever it is. Um, so within this, there might be multiple paintings. So I don't have to say, you know what, I have to pick the very best one. I could pick the best two or three, because a lot of times it's really nice to paint in a small series of three paintings um, where they kind of harmonize together. You'll oftentimes, if you care about selling your paintings, you can actually 
sell in little groups because people like to buy, you know, that, that theme will go nicely in a room, in a dining room. In fact, I had a some nice people who bought six paintings of mine that all kind of went together. I never suspected that would happen, but they bought all six and put them all in their dining room and it made a really nice, you know, I was invited to their house uh, later to do an actual large commission for another wall. And it was really neat to see it. I had never thought of the paintings, how they were, and I didn't even know they had bought so many of them, bought so many, um, but it looked great. It was really a nice harmony. Um, it was almost looked like a seasonal series of these trees. Um, it was pretty neat. Um, so anyways, working in series, there are benefits to that, especially because you're also learning as you're going. Um, anyways, uh, this one's kind of fun, interesting. You know what? I'm going to zoom in one more time because I actually now I'm kind of attracted to what's going on in the right. So I'm going to do a super crop and see what happens over here. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Now it's got a whole different feeling. Like now it becomes about these the circular patterning that's going in over here, doesn't it? See how the trees kind of make a circle in the reflection? And then it's got this nice space in between. It, you know, I might have to do something. It feels like it's fairly split down the middle with half trees, half opening. So I may have to, you know, go back in and edit that a little more. But it's a lot of fun. So again, you can do this by simply printing out your reference and taking scissors to it, or you could simply take a couple sheets of white paper and just slide them over, moving them, you know, zooming in, zooming out. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can do this. I remember when I started college as an illustration major, it was a whole lot of Xerox copies, right? Scissors and Xerox machines. Um, just because, I mean, computers were around when I got to college, but they were not in wide rotation yet, and I definitely didn't own one. Um, <clears throat> so there's lots and lots of different ways to get to this, um, but I would like you guys to experiment with this. The other thing that's really great is simply doing your thumbnail sketches, okay? So my first assignment to you guys is to find the concept and define your main idea, okay? That can simply be one to two sentences. On that same page, I want three, at least three, more is better, little thumbnail sketches, okay? Does anybody not, well, I'm just gonna tell you what they are anyways. Thumbnail sketches can be just in the same, they would be like a horizontal format, little three inch by two inch or whatever size it is, as small or as big as you wanna do. Um, I often will do them in simply almost like one in, by one and a half inch, really small. And all, we're not looking for a detailed drawing. What we're looking for is the lights and the darks and a pattern. It can be very almost abstract. These trees could simply be dark lines going up and down and we're gonna simplify it to a very high level. So oftentimes what I will do to simplify is squint my eyes. Another thing I like to do is make a black and white out of it, okay? And from there, well, let me go back, control. I'm gonna do a layer so that I save this layer. So on my new top layer, I've got it. I'm going to desaturate it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my adjust and brightness contrast. It's funny that everything's going on to my other monitor. I will push my brightness and push my contrast. And from there, it very much simplifies the scene for me. So you can see that's the very simplified big shapes. It really just makes it almost kind of black and white. It's definitely a gray scale. So I'm going to say okay to that. And so there's the original, there's that. A lot of times this black and white version is the version that I will start to paint from, especially if I'm using the black and white acrylic paints. And you guys hopefully can see the advantage to that. It's taken it from oops, all of this information, which we can get lost in all these beautiful colors and this gradient of values to this, this feels much more approachable for me. For I like to remind myself that painting is hard. So anything we can do to make it a little bit simpler 
and a little bit more approachable, right? There's nothing scarier than a white canvas is great. These are all just tools for us to get in, get comfortable and get started with our painting. You know, I don't do this every time. I don't do black and white paintings every time. I don't, um, especially if I'm out plain air painting, you know, painting on location, I'm not gonna go through all these steps, but I like to walk my students through it a couple times so that it becomes both something you can refer back to when you're unsure about a painting or unsure about a design or unsure about your main concept and your main idea. These are ways to reflect back and kind of get a good footing before we jump in. And I know, because <laughs> I do it just as much as you guys, maybe not, or maybe a lot more, is I just get so excited and I just want to jump right in and I, you know, come to regret it later because I didn't take my time at the beginning. And uh, one of the things I'm gonna hand out here uh, pretty soon is the um, kind of the hierarchy, kind of like the food pyramid of painting and design. And the main concept and the abstract design are by far and away the most important things. So if you guys are writing notes, what I want you to do is in all caps on the, on the bottom of your page, write main concept and abstract design, really quite large, like size 18 font, size 20 font. Okay. So main concept and abstract design. Now, above that, in a slightly smaller size, you're going to write values and notan. And again, I'll explain what notan is here in a second. Values and notan. And notan is spelled N-O-T-A-N. All right? Now, above that, slightly smaller again, I want you to write color and temperature. And you can even put temperature below color so it makes it even look smaller. Color and temperature. All right, above that, last but not least, is edges and brushwork. And you can write that about as small as you want. Edges and brushwork, okay? So what that is, what you've got there is, from the bottom up, is the importance and the weight I give to the different concepts and painting, okay? So the main concept and the abstract design, kind of what we're talking about right now, is by far and away the most important thing. You wanna get that established before you move forward, okay? And then it's our values, our lights and our darks, or I put and, but it could be or, no tan. No tan simply in Japanese means light and dark, but uh, for artists, it means black, and white, not a value study, not a grayscale, but black and white. When I do a no tan, it will, I will often do it with a permanent, like a Sharpie pen, okay? And it really forces you to look and say, this is dark or it is light, which can get tricky when you're looking into the mid areas. If we look at these trees over here, let me zoom in right? And we are doing a no tan of this scene. Maybe for some of you, you're like, well, this tree is much lighter than this tree. So I want this tree to be white. But then you look at this and say, well, man, it is so much darker than the sky. So is it light white also? Or is it, you know, in the black in the no tan sketch? And I would think it's all black. Maybe this little lines of light could be white, but basically it's going to be like a silhouette. And that's a cool way to test, is that an interesting design or like all of these trees, if I did this as a no tan image of dust, I'm just gonna, oh, let me do layer, duplicate layer, image adjust, uh, brightness contrast. Again, I'm gonna push that bright contrast. So there we go. It's not quite as dark as I would like it to be, but um, 
Maybe I can bring back that um, brightness. But you can see how that really simplifies things and makes it almost like it's about silhouettes, about the big shapes. So that's kind of what a no-tan does if you imagine all this being much darker. Unfortunately, this version of Photoshop does not have a no-tan that I'm aware of. Um, I do have apps on my phone that I use when I take photos um, when I'm out plein air painting. Um, there's one called the Notanizer, N-O-T-A-N-I-Z-E-R, I believe, that I use from time to time. Otherwise, I will just take my photos and use the uh, noir black and white setting. If you're a smartphone user, I don't know what it would be on the other types of phones. But that just makes a really extreme lights and darks. And again, I'm just using it to see, does it have a good design? Does it have good balance? Does it have good flow? Is it letting me into the painting? Or are there is there a wall in the foreground that's unnecessary? Does it lead my eye through the painting in a pleasing way? Um, these are all things I want to be thinking about when I'm thinking about my design. Sometimes you'll just be like, yeah, it feels good. I'm not exactly sure, but it has a nice rhythm to it, a nice flow to it. It's got sexy lines, whatever it is. And sometimes we can get away with just that as, you know, I'm not sure why it's working, but it really, to me, feels like it's working. Another thing I want to look at a lot of times is, you know, I kind of feel like, well, this, everything seems to be leading me to this area, right? All these lines kind of feel like they're really, let me go ahead and draw them in. So if I were to kind of decide where is this, because I do like this one as my design so far. Look at this line leading back here. This line's wanting to lead us back here. This one in a roundabout way is kind of leading us there, leading us there, leading us there, leading us there. This one leads us to that line, which then leads us to this line. It's also kind of got a nice dark area versus light area. It's got some interesting little line details. So that really makes me feel like this all of a sudden is kind of more of my focus, right? Generally or oftentimes having your uh, focus way off to the edge like that is not our best idea. Um, a lot of times, I'm going to go ahead and just show you two different ways that I figure out kind of my ideal focus area, okay? So a lot of times, let's see how tall is this? this is nine inches tall by almost 12 inches wide. So nine is four and a half inches. So I'm going to look for that line, the four and a half inches, and I'm going to mark it. Boom. Okay, so that blue line represents halfway between the top and the bottom. Now this one's almost 12 inches, just a little less. So I'm going to go over to the six inches and also put a line. So now I've got my surface split into four quadrants, right? So this, again, this is a quick way to just kind of test. The one thing I know that I don't want, unless it's very purposeful, is I do not want my focus here, okay? It's such a strange thing that the halfway mark, the even split, is a dead zone. Our painting becomes very still and very stagnant, right? And it's, that's true almost anywhere on either one of these lines. So it's like a target looking thing. Don't put it in the target, okay? Um, what I will often do is think just outside of it. So here, here, basically it's those four spots. Those are kind of my ideal focus areas. It really feels good. Another way I will often do this is I will take my surface. So this one was 12, so that'd be four and four. So four and eight, and look at that. So there we go. And this one's nine, which makes it a nice easy three, six. So when I do it like that, when I split it into thirds, then where those lines cross is a fantastic place to put your 
focus, okay? It's not a rule, it's a guideline where it works really well. So when in doubt, that's what I will look for is trying to get my focus into one of those, not all four of those, not at the same time, but just one of those circles. So that's called the rule of thirds, right? How I split it into thirds there. A lot of times I just do the half and just to make sure I'm not there. That's the most important thing is I'm gonna put an X, not here. And I pretty much don't want it anywhere along that halfway line. Again, all of these guidelines are simply guidelines. They can totally be broken. Um, the best painters, you know, often, often, often break these guidelines. I hate to say rules, these guidelines. Um, and they break them to great effect. Um, one of my very favorite paintings by an artist, um, John Singer Sargent, I'll see if I can find it and share it, is this great big rocky, craggy mountain scene. And right down in the bottom corner, he's got this really beautiful waterfall, just kind of peeking in like a bad selfie. Like it just kind of barely makes it. And then the mountain almost bumps up against the top. He does all these, breaks all these weird rules. I don't know what I'm drawing all over this for. Um, he breaks so many rules in that painting, but it still completely works. But he was a master, huh? That's as far back as it's going to go. All right, well, I guess that's the end of that scene. Um, so let's clear that out. So we're back to here. All right, so if that's the case, how can I possibly move something into this focus areas, those four focus areas, right? And uh, let's get the X, all right. So now we can see that. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just make it so it's a little less so we can see both. All right, so now we got our color. We've got our focal point underneath there. So that just means that I probably either wanna draw some attention to this or I want to probably edit my scene so that things shift over slightly and become about that. Or I can decide to myself <laughs> that I know what I'm doing, me and John Singer Sargent, and we're breaking these guidelines on purpose because it is in fact gonna make a better painting, okay? So again, if, if you put the, something right in the middle and I come around or you post it and I ask you, you know, the, it's kind of a tough placement that you put the focus there, you're gonna have to be ready, drop of a hat, to explain why you chose. And you could say, well, Mike, I put it there because this is actually an iconic painting, like an icon, and those go in the middle. And, you know, or Mike, I wanted this to be a fairly stagnant and boring painting in a good way, right? Because paintings can be stagnant and boring. So maybe they don't, you wouldn't use those terms to describe them, but um, they can be quiet and slow. And, um, you know, maybe you put the horizon line right in the middle or the whatever it is, the dog, the cute dog, whatever, right in the middle. But I want you to be aware of that. So that makes sense, you guys? Just a quick nod, I can see your heads there. Great, yeah. any questions, yeah. please? Let's take a half a second. Any questions at this point? All right, Karen, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, this, is, this is Michelle. I'm, I'm wondering, what do you think about um, when, where to cut off like I know we're not supposed to think of the, the objects themselves, but sometimes I think, who do I want to cut off the top of that tree or the side? And what, what are your thoughts about that? The first thing I definitely think of, so, and I will get back to you, Karen. I saw you talking. Um, yeah. Karen has a very quiet voice. Karen uh, Dungy, is it? Or Dungy? Um, Dungy. Dungy? Dungy. Dungy, okay. Has a very quiet voice. So, um, when I see Karen talking, I'll uh, make sure to get back to you. Um, but to answer Michelle's question really quickly, let's go ahead and get off here. And let's say that I'm going to try to bring this. Um, where's our original vertical? Lost it. 
right. I don't know where the original is anymore. Um, so let's say I'm going to try to bring this area maybe more into the focus or maybe this, maybe that's going to be easier. This tree here, I'm going to bring this more into one of the areas. Um, so what I'm going to think is, well, it needs to go up and or down a little bit because, right, it's kind of right in the middle right now where the dark and the light contrast. So what am I willing to get rid of first? Am I willing to get rid of more sky? If I do that, then I'm moving this whole scene up, which is gonna bring it closer to this no man's land right here in the middle, right? That halfway. So I actually wanna stay away from that. So I'm probably gonna edit my bottom area a little bit. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think that. I'm gonna go, okay, let's edit that. Image crop, let's see where that brings us to. Okay, so now my lines that I drew are useless because they're no longer right in the middle. Um, and I would have to refigure that out. But let's just uh, pretend that now my new lines are approximately here and the middle stayed the same. So now I'm getting into a good spot with that. that. But I also wanna move it out just a bit and I don't really care about this tree. So let's crop him out. Right, and so you could again, you could be doing this just by simply laying pieces of paper over. Ooh, I'm starting to like it now. It doesn't have the touch balance on the left as the right. This is coming into a nice focal area. I feel this movement, and I'm going to use this line now. Somehow, I'm going to bring a line over here. I'm going to draw it in. Um, and so now, all of a sudden, as I'm editing, Michelle. I'm starting to see some concepts that I think could work. Um, pressure, I just want the size way down. Oh, I'm on that one, okay, there we go. Um, so now I see this nice line, oh, sorry guys. Let me make it so it fits on screen too, so you can see it better, all right? So now I've got this into my kind of focus area. So I was thinking this could be my focus over here, pink dot, but now I'm gonna make this one pink dot my focus instead. Okay, so I'm gonna play this tree up and I know that this line is leading us up there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use that line as a lead in and I'm gonna figure out, see this nice light versus the shadow right here. I'm gonna use that line to lead me back. So we're gonna have some nice movement. Our eye is gonna have this nice movement. And then I've got this also, and I can play up this, right? And so now I can start using some of those lines that I was gonna use earlier in verse. And maybe I can put something over here. Maybe I could, um, bring a, a hillside back here, right? Like a far back mountain. And all of a sudden, what does that do? That connects to this line. So now that this line's leading us in, I can use this line to lead us through the vent. You, I probably wouldn't want personally to put a mountain in there. What I would probably do is see that beautiful cloud. I'm probably gonna use that cloud um, a little more. To, so imagine this is a cloud, right? <laughs> a really weird cloud. Um, but anyways, you kind of get the idea of it, right? So I'm thinking lines, I'm thinking direction, I'm thinking balance, I'm thinking my focus. I'm going to keep in mind my, my concept and my main idea. But I'm really liking this design. What do you guys think besides my crazy cloud? I hate the cloud. Not gonna lie. Yeah? So I'm kind of thinking, man, I'm off to something here. I think I might just print this guy up and take it over to my easel so that I can paint any comments. Karen, I'm gonna get back to you now. Oh, sorry, before I do, before I do, Michelle asked the question though. Um, let's, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna do a copy. So let's pretend that I actually really wanted to zoom in. Let's go back to this other concept I had where the focus is over here in the trees. I love these three trees, right? They, they, they're strong, they're big, they're beautiful. 
they're bold, but it's the focus is about here. And when I did it earlier, it was a 50-50 split of these trees in this area. So I'm going to have to probably get in and edit these trees out, right? So what I definitely don't want to do is do a crop like this. Sorry, give me a second here. You, oh, just did the same thing I thought I had. I guess I'll just, okay, cancel. I'm just gonna zoom in over here like I was going to do over there. And what I definitely don't wanna do is this. And let's talk about this. I'm gonna make it fit on screen. All right, Michelle, really quickly, why wouldn't I want to do this as my edit? Michelle Fritzler. Well, it's, there isn't a lot of movement in it. Um, yeah, you've point. got the horizon line kind of in the back is right in the middle. Yep. The other thing too is, is that I've got what I call tangents. And unless again, they're very purposeful, look at this edge and this edge, my tree is ending at the top, right at the top. It just, it's, when I frame it, it's gonna feel like it's holding the frame up. And it's like, it's like when you give a kid a piece of paper and they make everything in their picture fit within that framing of the edges of the paper. We want to not worry. In fact, we probably want to explode the edges because our viewers are so smart and so beautiful, of course, that we can just trust them that they know what's happening at the top of this canvas, right? I don't have to tell them everything. They know that this tree is going off this and this tree is going off this, right? So that's one thing is I wanna make sure of my tangents. If I did have that tangent and there wasn't really a way to around it, I would just make my tree bigger, make it go off stronger or I would get in there and pull out my lumberjack outfit and cut down the top of that tree and I would bring it way down low, kind of like this one is compared to the top, right? Or possibly, like you said, it's very balanced. So, and you see how me uh, chopping the top all of a sudden move the horizon line a little more. Um, let's do it again. Let's Let's look at another crop. Okay, that feels a little better to me. This is a little 50-50 split here on the edge. Like maybe I don't even need that tree possibly over there. Um, can take a little cloning tool. That's a huge cloning tool. Um, I'm just gonna make a very slapdash effort at cloning out that big tree over there. There we go. Maybe that actually feels better or, you know, I could bring back, maybe let me clone a little bit of this shape. You know, and I could bring back, make this tree a little more interesting. Um, so maybe something like that actually would feel interesting. And then I, I keep seeing it. I'm like, oh, I see what else I could do. That'd be so fun. Cause it's got this nice, interesting shape. What if we took and, uh, Oh, let's use a little bit of this guy. And I'm gonna give us a little air over here. Uh, there we go. So now we got a nice little bit of balance, a nice little break in the tree. Um, and we, you know, and I'd make that prettier. It wouldn't be just round circles of light, but I kind of like that. Like that actually has a nice feel. Now I'm kind of attracted to this painting. It's very busy, all these branches and stuff. So I'd have to figure out how to simplify some of this. But I kind of like this design um, as well. So maybe that would be a second one that would kind of go nicely with uh, the other design. Um, yeah. Anyways, that makes sense, Michelle. That answer your question. So I'm yes. thinking I don't want tangents. I don't want, um, you know, I'm still thinking of my weight and my focus. And yeah, there's always gonna be give and take, but we are not, again, we are not slavish to any of this reference. We can clear these whole trees out. 
we could look at other photo references. We could put Mount Hood or a giant, you know, we could put the Grand Tetons back here. We could clear this all out and make it a field. We could clear it all out and make it a giant pond with no lead. And we can do whatever we want, okay? So whatever it takes to make the painting work. I think it was one of your painting or one of your references a while back that was from one of your walks at a park with kind of a wet grasses in the foreground. And remember what I did with that? I just went in and made the water much, much bigger because you thought, you know, when you said, what's the main concept? What was the main idea? It was about the trees reflecting in the water, but there was very little water compared to the grass. So I just went in and made it much, much, much more water because it wasn't about the grass. You didn't care about the grass. So just thinking about that, and that's where that main concept really helps solidify that. Figuring out your main concept or your main idea or and main idea really helps everything. It helps you, and again, you're gonna see this when you get to the um, critique sheet, helps you, um, this affects every other decision, our subject, our mood, our palette, our composition, they're all in service to the theme, the idea, the concept, okay? Everything. That's why it's so important that you decide that first. That's why it's the big, bold font at the bottom of your page. It is the foundation that is holding up all those other things. If you look back to those notes that I had you do on the bottom, right, it's main concept and abstract design. Again, that's what we're working on right now. And then we get to start working on our values and the NOTAM, which is our little sketches and the first painting that I'm gonna do today. And then after we've got that locked in, that basically gives us everything. And now we can go into our color and temperature shifts. And the truth is, if you did your, played your cards right and you painted a good value study, a good black and white painting, just like a good black and white photograph, you could be done there. That's how you know you're in a good spot, right? And then the color, that's the dressing, that's the bonus, that's the extra. Um, you'll hear me say it all the time. Color gets all the credit, but values do all the heavy lifting. They do all the work, right? Uh, all the time when my paintings sell, I mean, 90% of the time when my paintings sell, people say, I love the colors. They very rarely say, I love your value study underneath it or your value structure. Um, but the truth is, that is most likely what they're seeing. They just don't know it. The colors are what's so, uh, what's streaming out to us. I mean, even in this photo of these trees here, it is it's so much about the colors, right? These beautiful cools and warms and pinks and oranges and yellows and reds and purples. There's beautiful colors in this. But when I go and do the black and white, um, it's still better be interesting. Maybe not with all the pink circles all over it, but it's still better hold up to something. Okay, and then edges and brushwork. That's what um, most of my students, before I've kind of figured out this hierarchy of, you know, art and painting, um, most students are like, you know, I want to paint like Monet. I want to paint like Van Gogh. I want to paint like, you know, whomever, Michael Lorwick. Not too many say that, but, um, you know, they uh, are thinking the brushwork and the edges and that comes, that becomes kind of part of your signature. The more you paint, that kind of develops. I will urge you to experiment and to play and to look to the art, the paintings that really attract you by other artists. And that'll give you a clue in a lot of these things. Um, boy, there we go. That was a long introduction. I did not think it was gonna be such a long introduction before I got to the surface or I got to my um, easel. Let me go ahead and print up. Um, you guys still see my Photoshop, right? Um, are you guys cool if I use this as my design for today? I, sure. I kind of like what's got going on here. Um, I'll see if I have to print it up again. Um, otherwise, maybe I have it printed. I do not. So give me a couple minutes as I move over to the palette. My next question, um, let me go back, get off screen share here. is um, would you guys like to see this done in black and white um, oil paints or black and white acrylic paints? How are most of you thinking you might try to do it this week? Acrylics. Acrylics? Anybody else? I would do oil. 
What's that? I would do oil. You're going to do it in oil? That's because I just don't use acrylics, but that's fine. Okay. I can. Yeah. Great. Let me. Um, I use oil. Okay. Yeah. And it's going to end up as an oil painting. I just like to do a lot of my underpaintings in acrylics sometimes. Um, I may even do both. I think I can do both. I got two hours. I think I can do because the value study usually takes me about an hour. And that way, I actually really like this uh, other little design that I did with the trees close up um, that I was just using to show Michelle uh, an idea. Um, I am going to be painting on nine inch by 12 inch panels. Um, why didn't it switch over? Hmm. Um, huh. All right, well, I'm hoping that I can figure out how to get this over to the easel, the camera over there might need to be turned back on. Um, and uh, anyways, let's take a five, a uh, little bit longer than a five minute break because I need to do a little bit of printing and I'm gonna get my stuff set up. So I'm gonna do one black and white acrylic really fast. And then I'm gonna do a um, value-based oil painting, but I'm going to use, instead of black and white on that one, I'm going to use a brown and blue mixture and white. And I'm going to use transparent earth red mixed with French ultramarine as my black. Okay. And I'll, I'll explain why I'm doing that when we get over there, but there's a, there's a reason I do that and a history to why I do it. In fact, if you kind of look at the painting behind me, you can kind of see some of that being used in that painting back there. All right, cool. Five minute break, a little bit longer, um, at least until I get it done. Yes, uh, Susan. Yeah, I, I bought, because I read your your very detailed notes, thank you. I bought this uh, wood at Dick Blitz, so. Great. It has to be, I've never used panel before in my life. All I right. just put a coat of gesso on it and then sand it. Yeah, yeah, you can, you know, it just depends on what kind of texture you want with the gesso. Um, you can sand it as fine as you want. A lot of times I just leave kind of some of my brushwork from the gesso on there because I kind of uh, I kind of like it a little bit rough sometimes, a little bit organic. But no, I think, yeah, sand it. And then you're going to want to wipe that. After you sand it, please wipe it down with a very little bit of water to get that dust off. So how many coats of gesso do you put on your boards? At least two, but okay. typically three. Oh, okay. And um, a lot of people say to sand in between, but I rarely do. So I try I, to get it as smooth as possible with my three coats of gesso and then I sand okay. it. And so I have uh, sanded it when it's on canvas. So very uh, quickly, the last question I have is, does it have to cure the gesso? I've never let it cure. As soon as it's dry, I start painting on it. Yeah, I believe that, I mean, for sure, 24 hours. Um, okay. But I you know, from what I'm learning more and more about acrylics, um, they are suggesting a three-day cure and it's acrylic gesso. So I don't know okay. um, if three days would be your kind of ideal. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Could you tell me the colors again that you're gonna be using the acrylic colors? Oh, black and white. Oh, I thought you said something about blue and red and- Yeah, for my oil paints, I will show you um, value study using the blue, red, and white. Okay. For the oil paints. I just so don't today, if we follow along with you, we're using black and white. Yeah. Are you doing acrylics or what? Well, I've never done acrylics and I'm, I'm just starting in oils not too long in the last year. And yep. so I came to you to get some foundation. Great. And I'm, I'm so confused because of what you're doing with all of this Photoshop things. I, I'm not a computer person. Yeah. So I hope what you learned from that was just my thought process more than how I use Photoshop. It's just a good way for me to show you different crops and different kind of, what am I thinking about as I'm kind of zooming in or trying to figure out my design? Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, I know that, I mean, I don't even know if anybody has this kind of Photoshop that I have. Again, it's so old. I just don't, I'm so scared that it's, that if I update it, I'll lose it. Um, there are, again, there's a hundred different ways, hundred different types of software, Photoshop stuff um, that you can use. So if you are into it, otherwise, yeah, 
You can just mentally do it. You can do it with the pen and paper just by doing your sketches. Um, I, again, I used to use Xerox machines and scissors and all sorts of different things. Um, tracing paper, whatever it takes. There's so many different ways to get to your design, to get to kind of the fundamental, the value study, the simplifying the big shapes and making sure it just works, that it has a good feel to it, that, that you don't have unnecessary tangents, that you don't have um, all those different things. Right. And that's the value of doing a thumbnail sketch. 100%, yep. Oops. So yeah, sorry, I'm going to get quiet for just a second. My, I'm going to try and get these things printed so that I can take them over. I can always just keep them up on the monitor, but they're a little harder to see. Um, yeah, again, take just a five-minute break. Go get your tea and coffee right now. Um, and I'm going to hope my printer works for me. The other thing is you want to make sure that your reference and your cropping that you did is the same proportions as your painting service. It's amazing to me how many times I'll see people painting on a square canvas but using a long horizontal scene and not thinking that they have to edit that and just trying to squish it all in and trying to figure out why things aren't lining up. Um, so just to be aware of that. I'm interested to know when you um, switch from a panel to a canvas, what size do you decide to go with canvas instead? Um, I mean, the truth is I do have panels that are 30 inch by 40 inch and 36 by 48. And the last great big project I did last year for a vineyard, um, we did nine foot panels. Um, because they're so hardcore, but it took a crew to get them on the wall. It took three of us. They're so heavy. Um, and that's without frames. If we would have framed those things and we had to put special, you know, hooks into the walls. Um, so you just kind of want to be aware of that. Um, so it's a, it's a weight issue more than anything. Like the gallery in Carmel is like, yeah, we'll take panels, but only up to like a 12 or 18 by 24 is as small as they wanted um, because any size bigger than that and they frame all the paintings. Um, they said it's just so unbearable to, uh, to um, just try and hang on the wall and it's borderline dangerous. Um, so I totally 100% un understood that. Flip horizontal, oh, control Z. Um, trying to, sorry, heart. I can talk in paint, but I can't work on my computer and talk. Um, so yeah, for me, it's at about the 30 inch by 40 inch and bigger size is much more manageable on a canvas. It just feels, I feel better when I hand it off to my canvas or gallery. Most all of my galleries are run and I'm not being sexist at all, I hope, um, are run and operated by women mostly. Um, and so, you know, I just want to be cognizant of their ability to hang it and not get squashed under the weight of it. Because some of them are hanging them up on mantle plate, mantle pieces and, you know, kind of high up off the ground. So I don't want them to drop my expensive frames and I don't want them to hurt themselves. Um, so anyways, just being aware of that. All right. All right, final one is printing. And now I have to figure out why is this guy not turning on? Ah, there we go. Nope, no, never mind. Okay, so I had to remove the spotlight to change to this camera. Um, I'm going to try something different in the video or in this, 
and then I set it to a manual focus so that it hopefully won't be going in and out of focus on the painting as much every time my elbow gets in there. So I think that's about as good a focus as I can get. And yeah, the painting stays in focus because that was a big issue for us last time because every time I got in the scene, it would start focusing in on my elbow and everything. Does that look pretty clear to you guys? Reasonably so? Okay. Reasonable. Yeah, I don't know how to make it. I mean, it's a blurry painting <laughs> as are most of mine. Um, but does my hand look pretty good and in focus? Yeah. yeah. Great. The only problem I'm finding with this is that zooming in is going to be, um, I don't know how to zoom in because my zoom has become my, my focus. So that's not normally what I would use to zoom, unless I can do this, no? All right, so as always, I'm trying to learn a little bit, little bit by little bit. And uh, trying to, oh man, really being touchy. Where's my hand? All right, there we go. Okay, so at least there, it doesn't go out of focus every time I get in the scene. So that may be a little nicer. We can vote at the end if you prefer the other way and I can still try to work on that. Um, Are you still pinned? No, I couldn't pin myself because of, uh, I changed the camera angle. Maybe I can pin before I had, uh, Hmm. Yeah, I lost that option for some reason when I changed cameras. Speaker view, yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't even have the three little dots to uh, let me choose from any longer. So that's interesting. I don't know why that happened. So just be very aware. And anytime somebody talks, I'll try to talk and get the screen right back. Um, I guess. Let's go back and see if I can pin it when I'm in the other setting. So let's go here. Huh. I'm not even seeing the op option to pin it any longer. That's really weird. Like if I click over Denise or Gail, it's giving me the option to pin yours, but not my own. So I don't know. Show me while I'm eating. <laughs> What's that? So yeah, there's Gail. Show me, show me while I'm eating breakfast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what does pin mean? Pin, pin means it would, so see how it goes to you when you talk? Um, it should stay on me but I am not seeing that as an option. And it's really strange because I had it earlier. Okay. Yes. Yeah, when I click on your picture on the three little dots in the tiny blue square, a little window drops down and it says chat or pin. So. Yeah, maybe if you pin me, everybody okay. pin me. <laughs> did that work? I did. Yeah, I did. sorry about that. Uh, sorry. Nope, yep, let's just do that. I appreciate you telling me. Um, yeah, I don't know why the little options are just not on here. It um, does show that you can be pinned though. I mean, it looks like we've got some things going on in chat. Okay, everybody's introducing themselves. Yeah, um, I, just, uh, I just pinned you and now when others talk, I don't see them. Oh. Okay, great. All right, so just pin me. Um, and then I see a question about Procreate. Procreate is fantastic. Um, that's one that I'm trying to learn. Um, at least I think that's the app I've been using. That's the one it's called. Um, just gonna check really quick. Oh, I'm using something called Affinity Photo is my new substitute. But Procreate is another great one. Any, any software that you like that is, uh, lets you do some editing um, Affinity uh, Photo is what I'm using. It's $25 forever, um, where Photoshop is $30 a month <laughs> um, forever. Um, and you get all the updates with Affinity. Uh, Affin yeah, and people really like it. Um, 
and it's pretty amazing, but it's a steep learning curve. I'm having a kind of a hard time. There are a whole lot of videos that you can watch to learn, but I haven't done that yet. I've just been too busy. Um, great. Um, all right, let's swap back over. I apologize that I'm not able to pin this. Um, how to pin myself. Um, well, something I'll try and learn for the next class. Back to that, changing that, you know, do black and white. So this is a painting that was started in black and white. And then basically what I've done is I've gone over it with the uh, transparent earth red and the Indian yellow and done washes. And now I've got this kind of foundational uh, value painting, which I will eventually, um, and then probably tomorrow or something, because it's pretty dry now, I will go back in and paint. Uh, bring my colors in. So that's just kind of how I design my foundation. Um, here's another one that was done the same way. This one's just less done. It just has, it was done in black and white acrylic. And then I've basically done a little wash of kind of a purpley pink color. Um, and I'm just experimenting with that a lot right now. Um, it's another one was black and white and it's got a little bit of reddish color and so it's just a nice base for my beginning of my color work so I've got everything established I got my designs um, I didn't overly commit to um, to any of the um, you know it's not too 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 detailed but it's got enough information that as I'm coming back in so we want it right about there. I think I'll just do one at a time. I was thinking I'd leave the other one up there while I was working on it, but we're gonna do the acrylic black and white first. Got my little nine by 12, so you can see it's a panel. And it's just basically on cradle boards, pretty nice and basic. Um, during, I like painting on birch. So normally the backside of it would be birch, but this is just a press board, but it's a acid free press board that they're attaching just during COVID. Um, and I think we're not getting along with the Russians very well. Um, we're not, I haven't been getting, um, they're not getting as much birch over, sent over from Russia. So, um, I'm just painting on what I can get nowadays, like everybody else, um, but I prefer birch. Um, so that's my nine by 12. This is how I set up my palette, which works great when I'm working with oils, but with acrylics, they're gonna be a little runnier because I'll be using water to mix. So I'm going to, in fact, be using my very large palette. This is my great big palette here, uh, my paint cleaning area. I'm going to be putting my acrylics down on there so that um, now I got to refocus it. That looks pretty good still. That looks pretty clear where my hand is. Um, yeah. Great. Um, let's see if I can zoom in just a tiny bit more. Good. All right. So I'm just going to be putting my acrylics down on the big surface here. And um, that way they're not just running and dripping down this. But my oils will stick up there. And so when I do the oil paints, I can use that palette. And it's nice to have your paints. So I'm just going to squeeze out a little bit of white acrylic. And a little bit of black acrylic. And I'm just using really cheap. This whole concept of using acrylic paintings as my underpainting is again, pretty new in the last couple months, um, but it is a very quick way that I found and very fun kind of way to build up my painting. I've got my cup of water and a bunch of really bad shaped brushes that I stole from my daughter. Um, in fact, the acrylic paints are stolen from my daughter. Um, so, there we go. I'm going to be doing this one. So I'm going to go ahead and get a piece of tape and stick that up there so we can all see it. 
All right, so first painting, I'm going to try to do two really quickly. Um, first painting I'm going to do with my acrylic black and white paint. I'm just kind of using this as the design. This is kind of the final edit that we got to. And um, then for the second one with the oil paints, I'm actually going to do this as my design. Okay. Again, feel free to chime in if you've got anything. What I'm going to do very quickly is I'm going to mix a mid-value gray and I'm just going to put that on there really quick. So I'm just a little bit of white, a little bit of black, a little bit of water. And already I'm past the worst part of painting, which is that dreaded white canvas. You know, definitely don't have to do this, but I kind of like having kind of a mid value oftentimes to kind of work from. And this will dry really quickly, hopefully. Tack up at least so that I can, there we go. I'm gonna let that sit for just a second while we talk about, um, kind of the process of how do we build up our painting. So looking for my notes again. Um, so we found what we've done so far today, right? We found our main concept, which is the shape of these trees, the darks versus the lights and the warm colors versus the cool colors, right? Um, and then we figured out our design and now what we're going to be doing is our values. And that way, after that's dry, we will be able to come back in with our color, right? And again, there's a lot, so many times where I do my paintings, I just jump right into color, but I'm doing all of this other work mentally, okay? Because I've done this for so long and so many times, I have, I'm thinking about all this other stuff. I'm looking at this big design, um, something else that's kind of weird is there's a, just a slight hill back here. I'm actually going to edit that little bit of a hill out because it doesn't add anything and it doesn't quite make the most sense. Um, so I'm going to also bring it over here. So thinking about that stuff, um, almost dry. All right. Um, here's some ideas for you kind of if you're like, well, what is the visual concept? Like, what do I mean by that? And every, every good painting begins with a strong visual concept. Um, this is the, something that definitely beginners usually miss. Um, it's because they're so concerned with trying to capture the likeness of their subject. So I want you to think concept versus likeness in the beginning, okay? The likeness is important if it's important to you. It's not important to me that things look exactly like they do in the photo. I don't really care about that. I prefer that you make a good painting that's important to you, that means something to you, that's interesting to you, and that's doing what you want it to do, okay? If, if literally copying an exact likeness of your scene is what you're about, that's fine. But for me, I prefer poetic paintings, in my own work at least, over um, more like journalistic paintings. Does that make sense? Photo or poetic versus journalistic. A journalistic painting is just the facts, ma'am. And a poetic painting is just in there. And what's the idea? What's the feelings? What's the, you know, the much more romantic uh, concept of it. So uh, here's a kind of a couple of ideas of visual concepts that I've used in the past. 
Okay. And again, this would be like, what is this painting about? It's about interesting shapes, right? I kind of said that it's about interesting lights versus dark shapes. It's about great color. A painting can be about great color. You know, there, that could be the sunset. That could be, you know, the beautiful red birches against the blue, blue sky or yellow birches or whatever. So it can be about great color. It could be about unusual texture, right? Yeah. I think like close-ups of logs and rocks or ferns. They're just about interesting textures. It could be about sharp contrast. I love doing paintings that are kind of about silhouetted trees here. I'll grab one. All right, so here's a, an example of a painting that is about color, right? It's a really weird, glowy, glowy sky. Yes. Here's a painting that is about contrast of shapes, lights and darks with some strong motion, right? Those interesting trees and that really strong contrast between the lights and the darks. Um, and the painting is gonna be dictated by that. Here's one that's about texture and just brushwork. And, you know, again, color as well, but not in the kind of strong, crazy way that we might think about it. Um, all right, so where was I? Sharp contrast, or often for me, quiet simplicity. Um, a lot of my paintings are simply about simply about just quiet, you know, especially if you ignore the grasses in the foreground, right? It was really interesting, and this one's painted plain air, of just how the light was kind of passing through back there. I didn't finish the bottom, so ignore it. But uh, this is what I was curious about. This is what I wanted to try to capture while I was out there painting with some friends. This is the view from up on top of the hill behind my house. Um, there's a little park up there, and I, I paint up there a lot because I can simply get away. You know, it's a 10 minute, five, 10 minute drive. Here's another one from that same evening. This is before the light became so pink. Um, and so you can see those red trees that were in the other one. And I took out this line of trees. But anyways, it's just about colors. You know, that was just about me trying to capture colors using a different color palette. Um, okay, so quiet simplicity, fascinating complexity. There's times where that could be what it's about, like ripples in water. You know, if you just do like these almost abstracted paintings or whatever else. Atmosphere, often, often, often my paintings are about atmosphere, the fog and the clouds. Um, mood, that's what I talk about, about like the poetic paintings. Um, this painting is not done, but it's definitely in progress. This is one I've got on the wall kind of waiting. And this one's just about mood. It's about these interesting trees and these really strong clouds kind of coming up behind the hill. Um, but I really like the shapes of the trees. Um, so we kind of, I just played up the silhouette. Um, and I want it to be a moody painting, but it's, you know, when it's dry. Um, morning or evening light. Could be about that. Could be about weather effects. Could be about backlighting. You know, where the sun is behind this object. That's something I use all the time in my paintings, right? If you've seen much of mine, I love backlighting. Um, horizontal movement or vertical counter move, or I'm sorry, horizontal movement with vertical counter movement. So we could say like these really strong horizontals with these verticals that intersect. Um, a good friend of mine, Don Bishop, he paints this L shape oftentimes, or it's called a steel yard, um, where it's really about these uprights and these horizontal lines intersecting. And he, he really plays with that as a, construct. Um, light shapes suspended amid darks. Or light shapes moving against dark shapes. Light shapes separate, separating dark shape with mid, from mid value shape. That one's a little weirder. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of looking at different notes I wrote down. Eruption of fragmented shapes and colors. Um, typically, I like my, my darks to all stay together and my lights to kind of stay together. But sometimes having them really fragmented and broken like, like we do in here, in these trees, can be really quite interesting. All right, so that's just some ideas. Um, and it could be whatever you want, but it, just writing that down and keeping to it. All right, so hopefully that gray paint is dry.
All right, so as I'm getting started on this guy, I want to talk a little bit about the steps of painting, especially like if you're outdoor painting or whatever else, and maybe as you're getting started today, you'll be like, I just don't know what the steps are of painting. So I'm just going to be looking for my big shapes here. Um, so the first step, if you guys want to write this notes down here, there's going to be six steps. The six steps to painting, just so you can have it with you um, and you're just kind of getting started and you're just like, I don't know what's next. So I'm thinking shapes as I get this going. Don't need that big of a brush. Um, okay, so the first step, wh who knows what the first step is? We've been talking about it all day. Design. Design. Yeah, kind of. It's actually before design. Yeah. Horizontal line. Oh, well, that's a great, yeah, that actually, my horizon line is almost always my first line. Main concept. Yay. Find a scene that moves me. Right? Find something that's interesting and figure out why is it interesting. Great. All right. So find a concept I like to put. Find a scene that moves me. All right. Part two. Find uh, the visual concept for that scene. So that's kind of what we're doing here. That would be the editing, the design. Well, it's actually kind of even before that, it's kind of like the horizontal, the vertical, because the next step, step three, is figuring out my design. Draw or imagine the no-tan or value-based design, which is what I'm doing now, even though I kind of did it on the computer too. You see how sketchy that is, but it's so great with these acrylics because I can just... I'm going to come back in and carve out shapes here just a little bit and make it a little more interesting, hopefully. So these trees come over even a little more. So I'm just giving my big shapes. All right, so where was I? Draw or imagine a no-tan design, okay? Paint or imagine a limited value study. All right, so that's kind of what I'm doing now. So you can imagine it like after you've done it a couple times, but for, for now, as we begin, we're gonna paint our limited value, um, value study. For those of you who um, haven't been in my class before, I, I understand what how this looks. <laughs> um, I know that you're just like, oh my goodness, I thought he was going to do something pretty. Um, but this is actually a lot of times how I work. I like oftentimes think of my painting as kind of simple, big, dark shapes to, and then I, so I go big shapes to small shapes, which is kind of what I'm doing now. And I'm just kind of thinking big, like big basic shapes. Like what if this, all these three trees here, what if that was almost like a puzzle piece? I could just pick off like one big shape. Um, so big shapes to small shapes is important for me as I work. I also, when I'm working in my oil paints, will paint from my th thick paint, or no, from my thinner paint up towards my thick paint. And that allows for it to dry properly. It also allows for me to how I apply it to the surface to be a little easier. The painting will build up a little more properly. So I'm almost thinking like a no tan, like a black and white. I'm basically working in just two values. Um, there's a little bit of darker, but it doesn't need to be. Um, and then 
I'll come back in and break that up using a couple more values. Um, and then I'll come back in and carve out some details. And I will hopefully have a decent little start to a painting. And the good news is, even if I don't, it's acrylic, so I can paint right over it. The truth is, if it's with oils, which I'll do next, and I mess up, I can just wipe it off and start again. All right, so there you can kind of see, I, I'm gonna have to move this area. Maybe I can do it with paper towel. Um, but normally with acrylics, they dry again so fast, I'm just gonna come in. What happened is, is this opening that's here that I kind of like, I moved it a little even closer to the edge. So I'm gonna wanna kind of get back. I just took a wet paper towel. And I can get some of that away. That'll speed up a little bit of working process here. Didn't tighten that very well. Okay, make sure my reflections are lining up, which is kind of hard because the camera is actually where I would be standing. So I'm painting way off to the right, which is always the case when I teach. I can't just stand right in front of my surface because I'll block it from everybody, which again, is the same even when I'm teaching live. Um, all right. Sorry. Okay, so back to that step four, paint or imagine a limited value study. Step five is paint or imagine the color study. Okay, so getting your colors in, kind of seeing how they work. A lot of times I'll do a little side painting just with the colors to see if they harmonize well. Uh, or if you've been in my work classes or workshops before, you've seen when I lay out my colors and then I pre-mix my colors and that allows me to kind of judge whether or not they're going to play nicely together. Um, and uh, so there's how I do that. And then, yeah, this step six is paint the final painting. Um, and then let's talk about that for a second. How I approach my final paintings, because I paint in oils, is again, I was just saying it, big shapes to little shapes, which is kind of what I'm doing now. I'm just kind of breaking these into slightly smaller shapes. I wanna make sure it's not too, too repetitive here, these lights, as they come across. Um, Big shapes to little shapes, thin paint to thicker paint, and dark colors to light colors or dark to light. So oftentimes what that inversely means is that in oils, a lot of times my darks are my thinnest paint, which does some interesting things. It actually makes the paint a little more matte, meaning not as shiny. So that, because there's nothing worse than a really dark area that's really shiny, for one, it's really hard to photograph, but for two, it's just getting the reverse effect of what you want, right? You're painting a dark area, but if it's really shiny, it's reflecting back light. So then your dark areas become, have the illusion of being your light areas. So by painting thin to thick and by painting from dark to light, you kind of work around that a little bit. that makes sense? Yep. yep. <laughs> Big to small, thin to thick, dark to light. That is kind of the order of how I build my final painting. I'm just kind of slowly building this guy up. Again, it's only black and white, so can't go too wrong. It's drawing so quickly, so nice. And that allows me to keep building it very quickly. Now you're just using all these different brushes. I'm just making interesting marks, brush work, keeping things nice and organic, not worrying too much about perfection or having anything just up here just right yet, um, I can come back in 
with my acrylics if I want and refine as much as I want, but I don't care to. Oftentimes, a lot of times the acrylic painting will be pretty rough and then I'll come in with my oils over the top of everything. What I often do with those oils is I will glaze in kind of a one color or two colors to kind of get a harmony going. And then I'm gonna come back in with my color and thicker paint on top of that. And that's how I've lately been building up my paintings. And it's been a ton, a ton of fun. And it really allows me a lot of experimentation and going back and forth with these acrylics. Super messy, right? And I'm just thinking shapes. I am not thinking things. If I hear in my head, Grass, 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 leaf, 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 cloud, cloud, cloud. Then I know I'm making, I'm, I'm making, um, I'm not making things, I'm making the idea of things or the symbols for things. And oftentimes we just stop observing at that point. I'm just thinking lights, darks, and different shapes. And I'm just kind of mimicking these shapes. I'm not thinking this is a tree, this is grass, you know, with shadows going across it. I'm not thinking any of those things. I'm just thinking this shape, this dark shape leads into this lighter shape, leads into, you know, relates to this shape. Like this shape, I broke it up too much. This big dark shape over here, which, you know, is a tree, but I just don't want to be saying tree, 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 because it gets, it's dangerous, right? If you're one of those people that goes in and paints and, you know, a tree and you're like, well, this tree has 1,000 leaves, leaf, 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 leaf. You're using what I would consider a stamp tool all of a sudden. You've turned your brush from a mark making tool into a a, you know, a various mark making tool into a stamp tool. And unless that's your real, real goal, it can get you in a lot of hurt. And we stop thinking, we stop observing. So just be aware of that. We paint, we do not paint things. We paint, anybody? We don't paint things. Shapes. Shapes. What else? Values. Values. And then lastly, colors. Okay. So that's what I want you to think is painting shapes, values, and colors. And then you can think edges and temperature if you want. But shapes, values, and colors. If you put the right shapes, the right values, and the right colors in the right places, it becomes a painting. And it becomes a thing. And that what it becomes is up to your viewer. I mean, you try to give them a lot of hints, but you got to trust your viewer. All right, still nice and messy and organic, but I'm kind of liking where it's going. Let me clean a brush. Maybe I don't need to. So I'm using a really lousy, lousy white, very thin and runny. Um, the first batch of acrylic paint that I stole from my daughter and used up and have not yet replaced was much better. So having a nice kind of a thick white would be really great. I'll probably have to do this a couple times, but that's all right. I'll get figured out and it will allow me to And normally without a live audience, without a live studio audience, I would have designed this tree because remember this tree kind of became one of my focal points. 
and I haven't. I've just kind of thought, oh, let's make it interesting on the fly, which is always dangerous. Um, so we'll see if I can pull that off, but maybe not. Maybe I'll have to come back at it a time or two. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, I think it is. Basically, I'm just covering the whole sky with white because um, I want to bring in some transparent colors and they'll look much more glowy over the white gesso than they would over the gray gesso. It doesn't mean that if I you know, was really wanting to work this out, I could, um, I could definitely figure out gradations in the sky, but I found that to keep it simple, I usually just make my skies and my reflections, bright reflections in the water really light. And that kind of just helps keep things simplified. Gonna trim this tree over here. Uh, I still don't know what to do with that guy, so I'll have to keep thinking about it. But in the meanwhile, I'll keep painting. I let this guy get a little close to the edge there, didn't I? And you can make it as, you know, perfect to the reference as you want. I could, you know, come in and definitely draw all these shapes out much better. I could take my time. I could be using littler brushes. I could have, you know, done a pre-drawing a little bit. But a, a lot of times I kind of like the organic nature of how things kind of start to uh, appear with these big brushes and kind of messy edges and, um, I will often just do it kind of like this with my first sketch on there. Because again, this is all for me. This is all going to get covered with the oil paint. Um, so I'm not too worried that it's so, so, so perfect. These are notes for me. Sometimes they end up really beautiful, this sketchy thing can end up really beautiful, but a lot of times it's pretty rough. And I'm kind of editing, you see, like I took out the hill back here, um, trying to figure out kind of almost reversing it. I almost put it over on this side and I'll probably just make those trees way back in the distance. Yeah, I'm already kind of wishing maybe I'd have taken, you know, I didn't do any of my little thumbnail sketches or anything. It might have been nice to kind of figure out some of these shapes, but like I said, this is so that you guys can kind of see the different steps. But when in doubt, like if I, if you guys weren't watching right now, I would probably step back from my painting and take a second and do some sketching. Maybe even just even over here, I would just be like, okay, what's some cool shapes of the tree? or on my palette. Um, so a lot of times you'll see little drawings on my palettes, um, just of different concepts and ideas. Um, so when in doubt, just take a second, take a breather, go, you know, refill that coffee again, get away. Sometimes a five minutes away from the canvas can really help you see things clearly and see if the shapes are interesting. The other thing I'm kind of enjoying about painting with acrylic um, first is that I get all these interesting textures in the paint. You know, this acrylic leaves so much more brush marks. Um, so I don't have such a smooth painterly surface. Um, and I'm kind of figuring out like, 
you know, I can put some brush strokes in here that will eventually be colored clouds. Um, you know, kind of be hinted at in the brush strokes that will show through, even though they're all white. If that makes sense. They'll be kind of shown through in the texture. All right, 11 o'clock almost, so it should be good. We should be able to get this one in, one done with the oil paints. All right, so now get a smaller brush here. I'm going to bring in some of the highlights on those grasses a little bit brighter. The light hitting those grasses. Even lighter. Not as light as the sky by any means, but quite bright. It's kind of, the light's coming across from the right side, hitting the faces of some of these little grassy areas as they come out of the water. Almost feels a little too bright, but we'll see. So I got a tree back here that's kind of getting, picking up some of the light nicely. And he's got his nice trunk lit up. See if that works or not. It's nice in the photos, but doesn't mean it would. It's going to totally work in the painting. A couple of sky holes. I don't want to overdo it on the sky holes. Um, they're very attractive and beautiful in the photos, and it's very easy for us to overdo them as painters. So, constant. Well, Remember that less can be more for sure. So yeah, very fast, but you guys see the big shapes, just kind of the three values. Um, let's see what happens if I flip up the light there. So that's without my overhead light, which makes my studio kind of dark, but you can kind of see some of the grays a little better in there. Um, I, can, I, I mean, I could really make this as detailed as I want. I could come in and, you know, start really getting all the fine detail, or I can just say, you know what? I just need my big shapes, the big notes, and I can come back in and uh, do all this with my oil paints later. Um, and so that's kind of up to you, is how, how refined do you need this or want it? Um, what happens when I overly refine it, <laughs> As you can imagine, as you begin to fall in love with it, and there's times where it's like, oh man, I just don't even want to color into it. I don't want to mess it up. Um, so it's a fine line between painting, you know, spending so much time that you kind of fall in love with the thing versus just getting enough so that you can move forward in an, un in an educated manner so that you've, you know, made the right choices. You've got kind of the next things worked out and off you go. And I just love looking and one thing leads to the next thing, leads to the next thing. A lot of fun for me. You can see how I can just keep working on this for hours versus just going, okay, that's enough, Mike. Give it a break, sir. 
You've got what you came for. Step away, start the next one. There's a joke. How do you how does an artist know when or no? How many artists does it take to finish a painting? Two. One to paint and the other one to smack the brush out of his hand. <laughs> Something like that. You get the point. Okay. I'm just gonna stop there. I keep saying that, but um any chance you could zoom in so we can see the brush strokes? I'm having a hard time figuring out how to do that with the new settings on the camera because what I used okay. to do is zoom is now my focus because I'm on a manual focus versus the autofocus and I'm on video versus camera. How about I <laughs> zoom it manually? <laughs> All right, and you focus on the brush strokes. Hold it here and try focusing. Good luck. Huh. Yeah, a little bit hard to see with just the black and white. Um, there's not a lot, I guess I was trying to show you texture, that doesn't matter. Um, but you can kind of see they're pretty sloppy, right? Um, but this has kind of got some cool stuff going on over here just using the grays and then painting over with the darks and the lights. I kind of really like that. Um, yeah, and just kind of little negative shapes are kind of interesting. There's my little lit tree kind of in front of the dark tree that's catching just a touch of light. And, you know, that'll definitely get played up when I bring in color. And now she's barely a value thing. Um, yeah, there's some nice kind of interesting negative shapes. Um, like I said, I could just keep working this um, for, until, you know, until I want to. So I'm gonna to totally let you guys decide um, when you think you're done, like what's enough, how much information you want. You so say, if you want to paint a beautiful kind of finished black and white painting, that's fine. If you wanna paint something that you're definitely planning on painting over with color, that's fine as well. It's gonna be up to you. Um, sometimes it's really nice to do the different stages and kind of have them as notes to keep. Other times I just kind of keep moving forward, keep painting, meaning I will cover them up. All right, cool. Any questions on that, guys? Anybody, everybody understand why that's kind of become interesting and <laughs> fun for me as a working as a uh, an opportunity a way to work all right next one is a horizontal all right you guys chance for another short break because i need to clean up all these acrylic paints that are all over the place because i'm going to change two oils so all my brushes are now sitting in their tub of water Move that out of the way, and then I need to clean up these acrylics because otherwise I'll get them on everything. I'm just going to take my glass scraper and pull that out. If anybody is curious about seeing some more of my black and white value paintings, um, I read that out of focus over there. Um, let me know, or you can go to my Facebook business page, which is just, I believe, Michael Orwick Arts on Facebook. And there's a number of videos of me doing acrylic black and white paintings on there. Um, I may be able to just go and share those to our group page as well. Next reference. Man, we are covering and doing so much today, you guys. So for those of you who are new to new with me, I apologize. I cover always too much. 
um, go over a lot of stuff. But don't worry, this is kind of an introduction to it. We will be repeating a lot of this and learning and going into depth on a lot of this as we continue. Michael, can you post uh, a picture of the uh, black and white acrylic um, painting you just did um, on the Facebook page? Yeah, that's not and, a problem at all. And what I usually will do is take some photos and I'll post them, yeah, definitely after class as they often get posted with the video link. Um, let's do it. Yeah, it's big and messy. So you can decide how clean and how perfect you want that for yourself. All right, so I'm gonna squeeze out some earth red. Oh, maybe this tube's done. This tube is done. All right, so big dab of transparent earth red. I use Gamblin's colors. At least I'm using them today. And a dab of French ultramarine, or just ultramarine blue. And wait. I'm not going to use any medium or anything else with this. Um, <clears throat> what I am going to do is take just a paint touch of the paint thinner, just a little bit. I'm going to mix that with the earth red, just a little bit. It's not much just to kind of speed it up a little bit. And I'm gonna add just a touch of my French ultramarine. I don't know why, I, just ultramarine. I gotta stop saying French ultramarine. And I'm gonna mix those. And now what I'm gonna do is, see this nice, big, beautiful shape? I'm gonna kind of draw it in with my big brush and then I'm also going to come back in in a somewhat subtractive style and clean up the edges with my paper towel, okay? So then you're gonna see two ways that I start a painting, and then I will do the third way that I start a painting next week, which is the more traditional way you've probably done it, where you kind of draw out the big shapes and fill them in. But I really, what works really well for my brain a lot of the times is Shapes and values, very little to do with things. So my first line. All right, so I kind of got my horizon line. I'm looking at the big dark shape. I'm squinting my eyes when I look at my reference. Beautiful, right? And again, the reason I use the earth red or the, any kind of nice brown with do a burnt umber works wonderfully for this. Uh, it's just not as transparent. I like that transparent earth red because of its transparency. But when you mix it with the French ultramarine, it almost makes black. But the cool thing about this dark color, which is, which is what I want, is that it, um, it uh, 
can be very warm, like you see here, or very cool, just depending on which color I let the paint lean towards. Is it leaning towards the French ultramarine? I mean, ultramarine, gosh, or the earth red, transparent earth red. Michael, could you use a, uh, the alizarin red instead? Sure. Yeah, I would imagine so. Alizarin is quite trans is fairly transparent. Um, yeah, I mean, the burnt umbers work, but they're, again, not as transparent as this one. Um, I've seen also, instead of the French ultramarine, people use phthalo green mixed with brown, makes some really interesting, beautiful colors. Isn't that cool looking already? Oh, I love that. I just love that warm coming off the cool. Just makes me so happy. <laughs> it's such a not, it's such a nothing, but I love it. So again, I'm just gonna give you guys tools. I'm not gonna suggest that one of these ways is better than the other or that anything else. It's just the three different ways that I enjoy starting my paintings. And again, I'm just gonna show you two of them today. And they're just fun for me. They're interesting. For me, painting really kind of needs to be fun. If I'm not having fun, you know, what's the, I, I'm working hard to make this my job. I may as well make work hard to make it a fun job. And for me, I love the constant delight of discovery. And so for me, that means experimenting. But I want to experiment within reason. I want to have a framework that I'm ex experimenting within so that I can understand what's happening when things work out or when they fail. I can go back and comprehend what happened. All right, so there we go. I've got my big, crazy, almost scary dark shapes, right? I am gonna- Michael, uh, did you say you're using gambling paints? I am, but it really is, yeah, I mean, I love- all right. I, and That's all right, I just wanted, I thought that's what you said, I wasn't sure, so. Yeah, Gamblin, they're a local Portland brand and they're one of the best in the world. So we're lucky and we, they uh, support OSA from time to time with different things. And uh, so, yeah, it's a great company. Um, you know, if you're just starting out painting and trying to figure out what brands, you can't go wrong with Gamblin. But almost all paint brands are pretty good. Um, so the tools I'm going to be using, hopefully everybody has some Q-tips in there, in their bathroom or wherever. Um, I just buy them from Costco. I've got a number of different kinds here. Um, I've even had students who bring me back specially weird ones from Japan and stuff when they go. Just everybody knows I like <laughs> Q-tips. I have a, probably about 10 different types now. But for the most part, it's just the Costco ones. Um, the other kind I really like are actually the dollar store ones. Um, I like to joke that there's something you should never put in your ear. The ones from the dollar store, they're like rock hard, but they, uh, but they um, last a long time. They keep their shape, whereas the ones from Costco are really soft and uh, don't hold up as long. But they're more absorbent, so they'll pick up more paint. So anyways, you learn what the different Q-tips do. And I'm just using my paper towel. Uh, for now. Um, I'd have to actually add a little paint. I'm going to add a little paint thinner onto the top because this has got too dark up here already. So a little paper towel or a little paint thinner on my paper towel and I'm just looking for the big shapes. Mm -hmm. mm. Just kind of softening those edges, trying to retain some of that information. Kind of looking at my reference from time to time, seeing what's interesting, what's nice in there, what are the big shapes that I liked in there. You can see how I'm off to kind of a head start when I paint with, um, instead of just using black and white, I use a brown and a red to make my darks. 
And there's sometimes too, I'll even throw Indian yellow into the mix, um, which does some interesting things. So right now I'm getting, working into a very dark, dark uh, surface, very kind of moody. Let's get our band of light coming across here. So we have a couple little spots where some light's kind of coming up and onto some objects up here, some bushes and whatnot. But it starts off quite messy. So there we go. I've got a big kind of messy shape. I think I'm going to go ahead and take a big brush and just brush it out lightly. Um, and then I'm going to come back in and do negative shapes. So, so far right now, you, again, it's messy. I understand. Um, I apologize to my new friends out there who are like, what have I signed up for? What is this guy doing? What kind of breaks is he taking? But just stick with me for a minute and I'm going to show you using negative shapes. So right now I'm just taking a big brush, a little house painting brush. And I'm just going to very lightly brush this out. I like to think of this way of painting as almost like working on a whiteboard, like in a school setting, where you can just quickly wipe on, wipe off everything. Nothing's committal. Everything's very liquid. I, I almost, I, I, I compare it to like sculpting with soft clay because everything's, I can just move things around very quickly. Okay, that makes sense a little bit there. Now what I'm going to do is bring back my wet paper towel again, and I'm going to look to my big light shapes, which is my sky. I want to make sure it's not too drippy. I didn't add too much paint thinner. Okay, it's pretty runny up there. Um, a lot of a lot of paint thinner, so I just grabbed, I just flipped my paper towel over, so now I'm on the dry side. So I'm just soaking up that paint thinner so it doesn't get out of control. And again, I'm just a big shapes to small shapes, even though right now it's not dark to light, I guess it kind of is. Um, I'm just trying to kind of figure out my big shapes because my little shapes will show up. I just need to uh, figure out the big stuff. And then I begin to triangulate from there. And I know I've taught a lot of engineers and people who really have a hard time just kind of letting loose and letting the painting kind of, of evolve and show up like this. So this way, again, is not for everybody. I urge you to experiment with it, to try it, because you may just find it delightful and so much fun like I do. But you may also go like, yeah, no, thanks for, uh, thanks for the suggestion, Mike. I never want to do that again. But at least you'll have another tool at your disposal. All right, so now I'm into this for almost 15 minutes. And you can see how much I've covered and how much decision making has kind of already partly been made. And you can see that 
after I let this tack up a little bit or dry, how fun this would be to just come back in and add colors across the top of it and bring in and you know retain some of this glow if I want, or I can paint over every square inch of this if I want. It's really up to me, it's up to you. I'm just kind of slowly lifting off more paint, but it's not a one-way track. If I want to, I could simply just grab my brush that has some paint on it and come back in. Like I said, it's like a whiteboard. I can change everything very quickly. If things get really out of hand, just grab a little paint thinner and wipe the whole thing down. You're you can get 90% of this paint right back off and start again. And all you'll, the only thing that will have happened is you'll have ended up, a little smudge up here, you'll have ended up with a nice toned working surface. That's the worst that can happen. Um, do be aware that you're, if you're using canvas versus a board, your absorbency will be different. So for some of you, it's gonna be harder to remove paint if you're just using um, straight canvas. Um, so just be aware that it depends. Some gessos are thirstier, meaning they absorb the paint, the, the paint, um, the oil in the paint, thusly kind of sucking it up a little bit quicker. Um, and some don't. I actually, you know, experiment with my gessos to see you know, which ones can allow me to do this? I use, um, which one do I use? The Liquitex uh, gesso seems to be a good kind of in-between where it, it soaks up some, but not so much. It gives me some working time. The gesso that I'm working on right now is the one that the panel had on it already. I didn't, I didn't gesso this one myself. This was gessoed by the manufacturer of this panel. Um, this panel is made by Da Vinci. It's Da Vinci Pro Panels. Normally, I use a company called American Easel from Salem, Oregon, but um, they run into some supply issues, like I was talking about during COVID, and I think are still recovering a little bit from that, which has been tough because that's the same company that does a lot of my printing. Okay, I am kind of liking where it's going. Any um, thoughts or ideas? Um, I guess I should tell you the history of this. I know a number of you have heard this before, apologize. But um, I had already gone pro. I was a very young professional painter at this stage of this story. I don't remember exactly how old, but... Um, and I was lucky enough to have been befriended by a couple artists that I really look up to and they would take me out painting with them and um, became good enough friends to the point where they could be uh, honest with me. And a gentleman named Don Bishop, who I brought up a little while ago about his design concepts, um, kind of leaned over to me one day when we were out plein air painting and told me, you know what, you need to work on your design more. Like I was just rushing, getting to the color, you know, I was getting to the fun part. He's like, you need to work on your design. So I asked him kind of what that meant. And he challenged me to do two to three value paintings every day that summer um, while out painting and give up color basically for a summer, which is tough because when you're outside painting, you know, colors are so important. But I did, I took him up on it and every day 
I would do a little eight by 10. So this is a nine by 12. So a little smaller than this. And I would do starting with black and white paint foils. I did um, two to three, four, sometimes five, because sometimes they only take, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Um, and I would do these little designs. I would just go out and look into the fields and the trees and everything else. And I just did design, 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 design. And um, by the end of the summer, you know, of course, I had about 60, 70, 90 of these little paintings. And oh, sorry. So anyways, I got kind of bored of the black and whites, but I definitely could tell something was happening and that I was learning and that I was having a good time. But then I decided that I wanted a little bit of color. So I mixed the earth red into the black to kind of warm up the black and then changed the black to the blue and found I could make my black with the French or the ultramarine blue and the brown could make a beautiful black, but I could get it to go towards warm or towards cool. Um, I haven't even used any white paint yet. So that's all just subtracting those colors. Um, and, uh, and isn't it interesting? It looks like it's yellow by Beautiful. And the red. But anyways, by using just those three colors, um, I had a lot of fun. And I really it started to learn about temperature shifts, so the warm versus cool side and how important that was. I learned so much about big shapes. I learned about design. I learned about lights and darks. I learned about some edge quality. And what was interesting and a totally unexpected thing was that winter, you know, the Oregon winters can be long, dreary, and gray. I had this stack of panels um, and I just started going through them and I didn't have my photo references. I didn't, wasn't really taking many photo references or if I was, I was taking them in black and white. Um, so I just started coloring them, but I started just using colors out of my imagination or from references. I was um, really into rugs and pottery for some reason back then. So a lot of my references that I would tear out would be like rug advertising. I really like Persian rugs. I love like the, <clears throat> the uh, really rich reds and rich greens and stuff that are in those. Um, and then in the pottery, I really was drawn towards the earthy greens and different things. So anyways, I'd use those as my references because I'd find, you know, colors that really went together in these pottery or in the, in the rugs. And then I would just superimpose those colors over my value studies. And the craziest thing, I, I really came to realize that I could go crazy with my colors. Like I could, you know, reality be damned as long as I had a good value study our good design and good values established colors could become wild in my opinion, or just, you know, they were really harmonious and beautiful colors, but they weren't true to life colors and people loved them. And I had so much fun and I learned so much from that process about so many different things that, you know, I wouldn't trade. I think that's one of the most important years of my painting discovery that I ever had. And so that's anyways, that's kind of the history of how I started doing it. Because again, in the value studies, in the beginning, I was drawing them out, you know, with a small brush, like we all do. I would draw this tree shape and then draw my trunks. And then I kind of went, wait, this is taking so long. What if I just covered the whole thing and just remove the parts that weren't trees and trunks? That's easier. And then if I want like a little trunk in there, you know, I want some detail, I can then bring my little brush in and I can add those details right back in there and have a good time. I don't know, hard to see, I know, but I'm just going to add a bunch of little spindly tree trunks in here. There, you can kind of see that one. Um, and uh, so anyways, big to small, and then I realized how much more efficient this was of a way of painting. and. You know, if you're going in and you're drawing all these little branches and, you know, trunks and everything, you, you start painting around them and you start protecting them. And, you know, they're secondary. They're just nice supporting characters. So I didn't want them to be too dear. So by building up the big shapes, my lights and my darks, I can now come in and hint at all the, you know, hint at detail all day long if I want to. Let's go back and add some more lake, shall we? I got my Q-tip here. Um, so I know it's a little bit hard to see, 
camera's about as close as I can be, and I think that's about as focused. Could be Try a little to focus better. a little better. There. All right. So hopefully you can see this. Yeah. So I'm just carving out little shapes with these Q-tips. And I also wonder, just watch Stand By Me, so I almost want to say wonder, wonder. Ooh. Um, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> who wrote the book of love? Um, wonder uh, if this way works for me because of being dyslexic. And it's, you know, it is kind of a different way of thinking, but it also helps me to think very abstractly. So I can add my Q-tip to a little bit of pink denim on there. If I want some light, like let's pretend, where shall I make the sun just for an example? Let's make the sun peeking through between here, shall we? And it will reflect it down. So I can, a little bit of paint thinner on my, I'm trying to think, do I want it there? Do I want it here? Let's just put it here for now. We'll see if that works. Look how light and bright that is. Isn't that cool? Whoa. Yeah, so fun. So fun. Love it. And let's bring. Aaron, you might want to mute yourself because you take over the. Oh, it keeps popping over. I like the responses though. I'm, I want to hear them, but uh, yeah, that way we don't lose the video. All right, so keeping that nice and bright, I can add some of that reflection down here. Yum, yum. <laughs> Good, thank you. All right, let's, yeah, I mean, now it's almost like a completed painting and now I'm into it for 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I mean, it could be, I've, right now it's suffering from, you know, no texture, I've brushed everything out, but you know, that could be okay. It's just a stylistic thing for some people. Um, and Make it look like a little reflection down in there. And again, I haven't added any light paint, so I can definitely come in as soon as I want. I mean, I truthfully could do it now because the paint's quite thin and we want to paint from thin to thick. So I'm in a good place. If I want to keep working it, I can, or I can, let that tack up a little bit. The um, that earth red color dries really quite fast and it will actually make the other colors dry fast. If I come in with white, I have to be aware that the white is the slowest drawing color and would definitely slow this down if I wanted to let it dry and paint on top. Um, so yeah, that's a little tonalist painting. Um, which is some of my favorites. I'd, actually, I'd be curious what you guys would think if anybody would be interested. I'd love to teach a whole like four or six week class just on tonalism. I would love it. Yes, yes. I'd okay. love it. Cool. We will do that maybe next, maybe in September. September, ooh, we could lead into Halloween with a tonalist series. That'd be pretty cool. Michael, if you're going to do it, get it quick because the... Uh, Preparation right now for the brochure going out to everybody is happening. For fall already? For fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. All right. There we go. Um, yeah. Boy, that's pretty in the monitor. 
wish it looked that pretty in real life. Let's just pretend it does. Ha, yeah, it looks great in there. It's a little yellower on the monitor than it is in real life, but that's like, man, that's giving me ideas. So you see the grass is very smushy, the kind of greeny area. It's funny that it ended up green. It's funny that yellows ended up and greens ended up even though we didn't have those colors, right? We just used red or brown, blue, and that's it. Um, our eye and brown, I mean, you, go ahead. What uh, can you review the colors real quick? Sure. It was for me that was simply earth red, transparent earth red from Gamblin, and blue French or just ultramarine blue, and that's it. Um, a very fun one to experiment with is is the earth red and phthalo green. Maybe it's phthalo blue. Right? It's a long time since I've used it. You could experiment with either of those. Um, and uh, anyways. Um, so Michael, will you, are you going to uh, post this picture? Not, well, both, but uh, the reference picture that you've created? Sure, I will do that. Um, I've posted the original photo, but I can, since we all work together, I can post these edits um, as well. And uh, you can see, but you can see that departure, right? I mean, even in that scene right there, you can see the original photo and you can see kind of how it ended up. And mine looked just more like big oaks versus these scrubby trees that the original looks like. Um, and it doesn't bother me. I like that. So a lot of times for me, my, <clears throat> my references are a jumping off point, an idea, a place to come from. And I really like that. Again, I, I like having an idea. I like having a plan. I like, but I also love being pleasantly surprised. And I love having that conversation, as it were, with the surface and with the paints and just kind of like, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. You know, that happy accidents, as Bob Ross would say, right? And you just kind of can go down that a little ways and see if it's taking you somewhere nice and if not wipe it back down take your paper towel to it take your um take your uh scraper to it if you need to um what well, i want to do now we still, oh, go ahead please i'm sorry how long would you let this dry before you paint it again uh i mean i could start now because it's so thin and it's going to start tacking up really fast so as long as I'm using a light touch, I could start painting. If I wanted to scrub in and, you know, do a lot of it, uh, probably two or three days because it's so thin. If it was normal oil paints, it could easily be a week. Um, but they're really quite thin. And uh, so this little, that little dark clump in the middle of the reflection is a little bothersome. I think I thought that that was something, but it doesn't seem to be anything, so get back to that. Um, anyways, what I would like to do, um, I'm going to change uh, off my view, um, the gallery view, so I can see everybody. Um, so you guys still have it pinned on me and it's staying on me for the most part? Okay. Yes. yes. Great. What I would like to do is um, do a quick show of my uh, setup. So for those of you who have seen this a time or two or 10, um, you know, and want to step away, that's going to kind of be it for class, um, for the demo and everything else. I'm just going to quickly, quickly give me one more minute before you run off and um, is let's just go over kind of my expectations for you for this week. Wake up, Karen. Um, <laughs> um, Karen Wild. Um, and quickly go over expectations. So it is find a reference, find, and then in that reference, find the main concept. Writing down one or two sentences, okay? Um, and then, and again, I handed out the, um, the critique form. Yes, thank you, it printed up right there, all right. Susan's, Susan's got it. Um, and you'll see on there, if you want to print up a couple of them, you can always just write on that. And you only need to print the first page, a couple. All the rest of it's just information of kind of what do I mean or what am I looking for in those um, line, on those lines. Um, otherwise, you can just write it anywhere. You can just use it as a reference. You could write it on the side on 
in, um, lined paper or on the back of your painting. I think I told you guys that I used to have a student who would write all this on the backs of her paintings on her final critique, or she would cut it out and tape them, which I always thought was really weird. I always thought, what if she accidentally sold that painting with her own critique on the back of it? <laughs> Be like, here, why you shouldn't have bought this? Um, <laughs> um, but it was kind of a cool idea. And um, so anyways, how I use that sheet, Susan, can you hold it up one more time? Yeah, so a number of you have got it printed up. Thank you, Lisa. Um, how I use that is I go over it in the beginning, answer as much of it as I can before I even really hit pen or, or brush to canvas. And then I will try to remember to go over it towards about two thirds through the painting. Because a lot of times when we finish a painting, you know, if you guys have ever been part of critique groups and everything, and we go and we show them our painting and then they get all the critique and a lot of times it's really good ideas. You're like, well, too bad I'm done. <laughs> you know, mentally this painting is done, even though those are wonderful ideas. And um, so I like to critique myself at the two third point um, done because then I can still go back and do the tweaks that are needed. Um, and then I will go back through with the final critique you know, hopefully with the wherewithal that I can fix any glaring things that are there. But if not, at least what I'm doing is I'm learning from that painting. The one thing I want you to remember, oh, my mom, my mom only calls once a week and it seems to be during class each week. So <laughs> I've, <laughs> sorry, uh, where's my phone? <laughs> no, where it is, it's hidden under piles of stuff over there. So let's listen to um, the beginning of, what is that, Paint Back in Black by Rolling Stones as done by a piano. Uh, probably call me right back now. Um, anyways, what was I saying? Oh, is going through and doing it at the end. So then that's your real critique, right? That's where you go through and maybe you take on the voice of your um, famous instructor or your... Uh, famous, you know, other artists where I will take on like, okay, what would sergeant say about this? What would, you know, my teachers from college say about this? What would my good friends who are great painters say about this? What would, um, you know, my students who are so knowledgeable say if I showed them this? So I kind of try to step outside the painting a little bit and look at it honestly. And what I try to remember, because be, you don't want to bash on your painting too badly, otherwise you'll hate everything you ever make. But you want to remember that the most you'll ever learn is from your paintings. And the most you'll learn from your paintings is the things that don't work, truthfully. And just keep painting. Don't keep staying on one painting till it's perfect because there's no perfect paintings. Just keep moving on. So what I try to remind myself is that every painting is not about that painting. Every painting is about the next painting, okay? That's really helped me get over a lot of heartache because there's nothing worse than spending days and days on a painting to only realize you don't actually love it at the end. So then I just, you know, I'll, I'll deal, deal with it because it hurts, it hurts every time, it's always gonna hurt. But I get over it by saying, you know what, what can I learn from this? What is this painting teaching me? Thank you, let's get to the next painting because this is the one. <laughs> this is the best <laughs> painting ever, the next one. Um, and so just remember, we're moving forward, spiraling up, failing upwards, whatever terminology you want to use. I've got a painter buddy who has a spiral uh, with an arrow at the end of it on his arm. And that's his motto is failing up, failing forward. And I like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's it. Every painting is towards the, and that's why I have controlled experiments is so when things work, I can dissect and say, how did I do that? That was amazing, you know, happy accidents or whatever. And when they don't work, it's, you know, I don't have 27 colors on my palette. I don't have a different surface every time. I'm not using a hundred different paint brushes or a thousand different mediums. You know, I'm experimenting with limited things that I can add and subtract to, but not all at the same time. And that way I can understand why things are working or why things aren't working. Okay, it's, you guys have all had that experience where you put out your 27 favorite colors of paint and then you mix your 28th new most beautiful color of all time with no idea of how did you mix it, right? So with 
two primary colors of each, two reds, two yellows, two blues, and maybe a brown, you can recreate your colors very well. And uh, you can grow incrementally. What I urge you to do while you're in this workshop is to push yourself, try new things, and you're gonna fail spectacularly anytime we try something so new. In real life, in your real painting career, I suggest that you push yourself about four or 5% um, beyond your comfort zone. Not so far that it's mind boggling and crazy, but just enough that you're always improving, always just trying something new, just something out of reach. But yeah, that's how I like to think of my growth. I mean, a lot of times, like when my wife comes up, she'll just say, oh, you painted 10 of the same paintings or, oh, you're painting, you know, they all look the same. But when I look at them, I can see a little bit, maybe not growth, maybe not, maybe they're not 5% better, but they're different a little bit. I'm experimenting a little bit. I'm trying new things. Okay. Any questions, you guys? Are we to do a black and white acrylic and an oil underpainting? That is completely up to you. I know you are an overachiever, so you'll do that. Um, I know a couple of you guys will do that. Um, no, I wanted to show you both ways because I did have a number of questions before the class, and I always do with new students and whatnot about painting with acrylic. I wanted to show that. And then in the next weeks, um, I will show how I go and paint over that acrylic painting and turn it into an oil painting. Um, some of you have seen that before already. Um, and that's just, again, that's fairly new for me. That's kind of an experimenting thing, but it takes me back to that whole era of my life where I was just really working on design and values. Um, and it's just a different way to do it. Um, so no, please just do a black and white, but if you'd like to do more, if you want to experiment, I'm all for it. Those who paint the most will increase, will improve the most, okay? How do we find the reference photos? Okay, so if you go to the Facebook page. And so what's the Facebook page called again? Oh, well, it's the name of the class. And okay. it's, a group. it's a group page. But um, in the first email I sent to you, it's in there and I will send it in another email. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, what is it called? Um, Design. Um, yeah. It's literally facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash the expressive poetry of color and design. Okay. Most of you guys are on there already. Michael, I have a question about your transparent earth red. Is that the same thing as transparent oxide red? Yep. Different brands, different names. Mm. Yep. It's an oxide red. It's very warm, very red. Um, but I like, you know, Again, I'm not too, too worried. If you want to use, use black and white, I just like to show guy, you guys that. I mean, I just, I can still see it up on the screen. It's now just a little thumbnail and it just looks so pretty to me. Like, I, I just like that little tonalist feel to that thing. Um, and then I go in and I'll add a little color into that, you know, add some texture because right now it's all very flat and smooshed down. You know, I could go in there and paint some grasses and some bushes. I can also get into those darks and add some purples and blues, you know, some other colors. So it's not just dark and light. There's information in the darks and information in the lights. I can add, you know, leave some of that yellow that's showing in the sky and bring in some purples or, you know, other colors. There's so many things I can do. Um, and it's so much fun. So, um, yep. That was the color. Um, yeah, I've got 12 of you guys are signed up for the Facebook thing. And anyways, when you get to that, if you go, you can either just scroll down, which take, can take a long time, especially after we start filling this page up. There's also gonna be on the top row, there's the about discussion, mentorship. Oh, and I accidentally signed uh, everybody up for a mentorship. <laughs> I don't even know what it means. It just asked me if I wanted that. I'm like, yeah, that sounds fun. So I think if you are a little more advanced paint, painter like Gail, who's been painting for a while, or Karen, who's doing so well, and maybe, a, you know, there's a brand new painter there, um, they could uh, team up, I think is what the mentorship is, like a buddy system, but I'm not sure. So we can just completely ignore it if we would prefer. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, the rooms are another thing where you could go off. I, we'll just ignore all that. 
Um, but what I want to show you is the last one, which is media. So it's about on that line right underneath the number members is media. If you click that, um, I can go back to, um, I don't know why I'm explaining it when I can show it to you. Yes, I can't. All right. Does everybody see the Facebook page now? No, don't. Mm -hmm. You do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For me, I'm still seeing the easel. Anyways, so at the top about discussion, and then the very end is media um, and all the photos that I've posted. And any photos that anybody posts are there. And if we want, what we can do is create an album. Now let's just create one. And let's just name it References for Class. And I'll, I'll fix the spelling. References for class, I'll upload a photo, I'll upload all of these. And so now you can go and look under that folder, they'll pop up here in just a second. And any photo references that you guys have, um, I know that I painted from uh, Kathleen, who was so nice to let me borrow one of her photos last class. Um, and anyways, any references that you guys are willing to share um, oh, why didn't it do that? Maybe they're loading. I don't know. Anyways, we'll get back. Stop share. Um, and anyways, any photos you'd like to share? There they have popped up after I did that. Um, please do. Please, you know, if you have, I'm sorry, Lori, I'm not hearing you. Lori Carlson. Hi, I just want to know um, if, can we go back and look at this again? Because I, I didn't get everything. I, I got so lost. Uh, you mean the video? Yeah, the one that we just, that we just, you recorded, I assume, this whole class. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's the biggest benefit to this whole Zoom thing that I just love, um, besides being able to just walk up my stairs and teach. <laughs> um, but is the fact that, yeah, if you, let's say, Lori, that you couldn't have made it, you had a doctor's appointment or company from out of town or whatever you if you don't show up I will record the class for you and you can watch it at your leisure and what a lot of people do Lori is that they will watch like you all did today maybe Denise was painting um, but most people will watch the class while it's live ask questions write notes and then what they'll do is they will re-watch it while they do the paint along and that way you can pause it, you can rewind it, you can fast forward all the boring bits <laughs> uh, where I just get repetitive and start meandering. Um, you can do all that and that's just so great. Um, I wish I had that with my instructors, that would have been amazing. Because there's so many times you're wanting to paint, you're wanting to write notes, you're wanting to look up what they're talking about and all those different things. And I just find this to be so great that we can do all those things all the time. And I will leave the videos up in fact, I haven't taken any down from last year. Um, I'll leave the videos up for you guys. So any of the students that have been in the last classes, your videos are still up. Um, I always say I'm going to take them down after three months. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> um, uh, I just need to <laughs> probably at some point take them down. Um, but yeah, uh, I will leave them up at least for three months. How's that sound? Even though I'm too lazy to actually take them down. <laughs> so that means like the one you did today you're going to leave yeah, some it will be it takes a long time for the zoom because they're long videos they're three hour plus some of these some of these classes i taught one that was four and a half hours i think a couple of you were in with me where we just kept going and going and you know if i don't have things afterwards i think by the end of it there's two people left but um anyways they it takes a long time for them to download from zoom to my computer and then i have to load them from my computer to youtube so it's usually not until Wednesday night. So where do I find it? I will, sh I will post the link to you. Just you. watch the emails and watch the Facebook group page. And I will start a, um, let's go back to screen share here. So do I get on your Facebook by, by going to that, um, <clears throat> that deal that you gave us in the, in the first letter that we got? Yep. <laughs> do I have to put a password in or something? Nope. No, okay, thank you. No, pretty friendly. I used to have questions that you had to answer. It says now that I have to let you in 
Anyways, I'm posting these references. Um, there we go. So now the references are up and under the media section. Let's go back to our page. So to get back from the media, this part's always been tricky. They don't have like a back button very easily. So then I just go up to the right-hand corner and you, if you just tap on the name, it takes you back and then to the about page. Um, so in the, oh, and the discussion. Um, so in the discussion, oh, it says you have to sign in with a password. I Really weird. Um, sorry, hopefully that worked out. So, I mean, you're in the class, so it somehow worked out. Um, I, signed, I signed in with Google. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I had to sign in with Facebook. Okay, so yeah, I'm sorry. It's just making you prove that you're real people now, or at least real enough to have a Facebook account. <laughs> it's not very real anymore. It's just, <laughs> I think too many people were sneaking in and doing inappropriate things with the kids' classes and different. Wow. So anyways, um, so anyways, what I will do is I will post, create a post and I'm just gonna say all videos will be under here. I will tab that to the top because um, I can do, where is it? Um, anyways, I'll post it and it will be at the top and I'll add all the classes all into one spot and that will always be at the top of the discussion page for you to easily reference. I will also send you an email once I get the link from YouTube and you'll always go to YouTube to watch it. So that's the easiest thing um, after it's been recorded. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, my Facebook business page, where I have, I think there's about 30 videos on there that are free, um, is just Michael Orwick Arts, I believe. Michael Orwick Arts. Fa okay, so we yeah, had. Facebook.com, Michael Orwick Arts. <clears throat> Are you guys seeing that page now or do you still see our Facebook page? We're seeing oh, I see it. Okay. So yeah, I just, I finally made the book that everybody bought last time um, available to the public. It is now up on my Orwick Arts website. So if anybody wants a book, you can go order that. And yeah, you can just see lots oh. of paintings I post and... In this, you can also just click on videos and yeah, I think uh, somewhere, I don't know how this works. Plus it looks different to me because it's my page versus to normal people. But if you go to videos, um, yeah, there's a whole just stacks of short videos, long videos, all sorts of different stuff that'll keep you busy through the week. Um, so anyways, free stuff there. Free stuff on my YouTube page, which is, I don't know what that is. I'll send you the link. Um, if you're on Instagram, I'm on there, just under Michael underscore Orwick. Um, if you're on Pinterest, I have a thing there with, what did we say? It was like, well, let me just look it up real quick. Um, it's like, I've been on Pinterest for a long time, so I have huge collections of references. Um, yeah, what do I get? 33,000 people look at it a month. Um, where does it say saved? Um, yeah, so I have 7,800 references on my Pinterest page um, that I've just grabbed from everybody and all, all the different artists I like, different art styles I like, lessons, all sorts of stuff is on there. So lots of ways to... Uh, Never cook dinner and take care of your house again. Just get some <laughs> lost Instagram, Facebook, and uh, everything else. The uh, last thing is, if you go to my website, please sign up for my newsletter. Um, I let people know about classes, workshops, uh, art shows, different things there. It's pretty obvious. I have two websites. One is michaelorwick.com, which is my kind of straightforward portfolio site. And then I have orwickarts.com which is more of my storefront. There's prints for sale there, my book. Um, I think there's maybe one or two originals left for sale on there. In fact, one of them is one I showed you during class. Um, yeah, boy, okay, that was a lot of promoting. Anything else, you guys? We got one or two more minutes. Uh, I want to know one thing. Yes. Do I need to order manganese blue? <laughs> No, do you have um, do you have cerulean blue? Yeah, I do. 
and that's, really that's, ability, John. I think manganese is just a slightly more versatile blue than than cerulean, but they're really pretty close. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, manganese is a little bit brighter. All right. Perfect. And, but cerulean's gorgeous. I used it for years and years and years. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And Thank you guys you day, don't you Michael. Know, what? Thank you for the day. It's always just a wonderful pleasure to be with you. Yeah, well, you too. You guys are wonderful. I really appreciate you all coming back in the middle of the summer and uh, celebrating my almost birthday with me. And <laughs> um, yeah, so I will be heading to Chicago right after the next class. I've been very busy. I was in Colorado during the last class, and then I was just in LA a week ago and now off to Chicago for a week. Um, but um, I've built it so that I will be back in time for class. So don't worry. Um, and we will be starting color right after that. So the good news is, is I'll have a couple paintings ready and drying and ready to be colored on. So next week I will be doing a, the third way of starting a painting, which is the more traditional way of starting your painting. Um, and, uh, and um, yeah, we'll be working a little more on design. I'll be showing you some examples of uh, master's paintings or other artist paintings using different forms of um, design. And then, yeah, then we get to the fun stuff, color. I need to make arrangements to pick up the painting that I got. Yes, bought. yes, I've got it. Where is it? Sitting right beside you somewhere. Yep, I've got it. Yeah, and um, all paintings done in the workshops during the classes are for sale. Um, if you're interested, just reach out and contact me. There is a very big savings. Um, at least 50% savings on any of the paintings done. And um, I do have a book for sale, but I promise I won't spend the last 20 minutes of every class trying to sell you stuff like I did today. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. the Facebook page. Let's all go introduce okay. ourselves. <laughs>